What's up, y'all? Welcome to another Dance Discussions. Uh, pardon us for being a little bit late. We we're trying to do something cool with, uh, with Zoom as well. So I think that could still happen, but uh, we're just testing a couple things out. But welcome B-Girl Peppa to Dance Discussions. There she is right there. Really excited to have her on. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hey yo. Hey yo, what's up? <laughs> what's okay, no plus frames. This is gonna work right now. All right. Yeah, right before this, y'all, we were just kind of testing some stuff out. So hopefully everything smooth, smooth with it. Yeah, we're trying so, to do stuff on YouTube too. Perfect, perfect. Yo, B Boy Impact, what's good, pal? How you doing? All right. So first of all, thank you so much for being here and uh, taking the time to do this on your Monday night. Thank you. Of course. I'm yeah. so blessed and I'm honored that you asked me to do this. Of course. I'm happy to have you here. Um, I know personally for me, uh, when I grew up and I, I started just entering, you know, uh, battles, going to events, seeing different things, I always seen you around and doing your thing. And then I seen you also do things with the sirens, um, you know, elevate your dance game and start adding to your repertoire i see you i see you okay okay work I can't believe yeah. i still have this jacket That's we got fresh. these made for some yeah sorry hey. Hey. Yeah. let's go <laughs> yeah donna That's donna it. um designed that design hey shout out to donna sunny d word all right um and just a lot of things that probably I don't even know about. You just seem like someone who uh, is like, what is that? Okay, I'm going to try that. Okay, I'm going to go kill that. Like, you know, I, I, I could just see that from an outside perspective. So it would be really nice to, what's up, Val? Uh, just to see uh, what's up? what goes Val behind Val. that. Of course, that's eight. my crew. That's my crew. Val. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, trying random things in life sort of thing. Is that what you're seeing? I, well, you just seem like you're down to just try things and, and when people just contemplate. Yeah. So that that's a very special True. Uh, True. attribute or yeah. what have you. So that's really awesome. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, just to see your see how things went, like what is your story to get to where you're at now? Everything. So, yeah. Well, as far as trying things, yeah, that's definitely that's definitely truth. I I'll try everything once. And if I like it, then I'll do it two or three times. But if I really like it, then I'll commit and, like, really get into it. So, like, even, like, with the different styles of dance, like, breaking obviously came to me first. And that's the thing that I did the longest. But around, I'd say, 2006, 2007, when, like, Sirens was starting to develop. And, like, I was around Donna and Tiffany all the time. And we all entered ABDC. Then yeah. I could not, I couldn't even get away from all the funk styles. I loved whacking, popping. Pop and Todd came in town and I was like, fell in love with that guy. And yeah. um, just loved all the poppers, all of you guys, Frantic, you guys. At every b-boy event, I would watch all the funk styles dancers and the funk style events. And I had so much respect for it because I love all kinds of dance, always. And I love all kinds of music too and knowing different you know, techniques and styles and movement to those different types of dance is what fascinates me. Very cool. Very so, cool. so yeah, there was like, you know, through my times, there was like, you know, I'd say maybe a year I was really into waving and popping and hitting and, you know, I'd go to you guys as whatever clubs and stuff and hang out. But then I, I always loved new Jack styles and I always loved um, locking and whacking. And so, in between my training to be a b-girl that competed in the scene i would always go and like explore my funk my love for funk style dances Very cool. and now i pole dance and now you pole dance That's great. <laughs> Hell yeah. yeah um so maybe we can kind of get like a little backstory of um just even before you got to dance right like like where are you oh. from and when did you first find dance and then where did it go from there, maybe? So maybe like the beginning, like of your journey. Great question. I think from what I was reported by my parents that I was in diapers and they would put me in a cipher already with a bunch of 
huge like adults back then they were huge to me and i was this uh -huh. little you know in diapers and they just put on 70s music like um my parents really loved like the bgs and they loved staying alive and so yeah. i remember that being my first song that i really loved was staying alive and they just put me naked with diapers on and i'd dance and they said that i would stop and look at them and like get all mad because they were laughing and i was like seriously down there dancing or something that was like the first report of me throwing down in a cipher. And then I think I just always remember just dancing as a kid, like everywhere I was dancing and singing and uh, in gymnastics when they enrolled me into gymnastics because I was, they thought it was um, slow when I was a baby. So they sent me to gymnastics to work on my motor skills. And then eventually it became like, I loved floor. The events like vault bars, beam and floor I mm. loved floor the most because you have dance in that. I uh, sucked at bars. I sucked so bad at bars, which is so funny that I'm a pole, I a pole dance bar. now. Yeah. yeah, and it's so, I'm on a pole now and it's so related, but it's so hard. And I used to get like twos and fours out of 10 in gymnastics, oh, right? Wow. It was terrible, yeah. I liked vault, like the power stuff. I'd like to run fast and hit something and fly and yeah. then tumble and I love to dance. So floor and vault, I was really good at beam. I fell all the time. It was like, yeah. Um, but then dancing, let's see, what else was dancing? In middle school, our school actually had uh, partner dancing in PE. So that's when I fell in love with swing dancing. And wow, then, okay. um, and all that, like just partner dancing, like being with a guy, the romantic stuff. But also in middle school, that was the height of um, New Jack Styles. So. Right. I was just, me and my friends were like killing it in the, in the school dances, you know, like the Valentine Sadie Hawkins dance where the girl asked the guy to go to the dance. Yeah. We were just like form ciphers there. And we didn't, we didn't break back then because we didn't know what it was. I mean, maybe there was actually, no, there was a couple of kids who would do like a backspin maybe or some sloppy footwork, but we, we love new Jack styles because all the MC hammer, you know, all, all those <laughs> all those fun dances and so yeah. that's why when i came into the b-boy scene and there was like specific people like flexum ace ventura you know the people from the bay area who did new yeah. jack style we would like it was like a connection on the dance floor like oh you know like when they put that song on everybody would like start rocking out you know uh so yeah new i would say new jack styles was my first official hip-hop style of dance mm. and then when i got to new york city it was unavoidable, like being, loving going to the clubs, going to um, Twilo back then, and, and just going, like even school dances, because I went to college in New York, and um, going out to clubs, I fell in love with b-boys out there, like break dancing, the whole culture. It's where I met Rockefeller, mm -hmm. b-girl Rockefeller, and she, she was teaching classes at Steps, and she was also just ciphering down in the Lower East Side. So that was like how the B girl life of me started and just Got going it. to clubs all the times. Like, and then LA it's unavoidable. If you love to go out to clubs, you see the best dancers in the world. So that's, it's a long journey, but yeah, there's definitely. a lot involved with it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. That, that really makes a lot of sense too. Like even gymnastics itself, it's like, <laughs> they're, they're kind of like, I guess it's forced, but it's like you kind of know you kind of know that going in that you're going to be attempting multiple things. So yeah. even even from the get go, you were kind of like conditioning yourself to do that to a certain degree. Yeah, not just personality, yeah, totally. but even, even just putting yourself in that scenario. The training, right? Well, gymnastics is pretty gnarly because they would be like, you can't cry, and you oh, would wow. have to go to the yeah they. <laughs> If you're going to, if you look like you're going to cry, they're sending you to the bathroom. So you're going, like, this was where I, I mean, that generation, nowadays, it's so different. Like, they would look at you back then and be like, you're fat. Mm. And then they take us to a gymnastics meet and then feed us um, pizza, right? And then um, just, you could never cry in front of anyone. So you go to the bathroom, cry, finish crying, then come out, go. Yeah. That's what that the training sense. was. Yeah, like I don't know. I mean, it, it's it's, it's interesting. It definitely makes you tough, and you know, transferring to me being a stunt woman, I would say gymnastics and breaking completely helped that because those two things owned me, mm. <laughs> like own in the way of like it, it, 
it took a hold of my life as well as as well as well as like how difficult it was right and like are you gonna try this and fail at something and fail and fail keep failing and stay in it or peace out right and so those two trainings definitely has helped me with life but a lot with my career as a stunt woman actress because in stunt women like as a stunt woman and as an actress in hollywood you are constantly getting rejected you're constantly <laughs> getting told no and all this stuff and if you have to be okay with that and i feel like with breaking there's it's so difficult it's the hardest thing i've ever done in my life mm -hmm. that it helps with professional life of being a martial artist a woman filmmaker now <laughs> right yeah i, I you 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 went straight towards things that are very physically demanding and then just what comes along with that and succeeding in it, uh, just the mental toughness. And you didn't just pick one thing, right? So you're getting it across oh, yeah. the board from all these extremely physical activities. But they're all related. Yeah, yeah. Like martial arts, like the b-boys in New York were directly inspired by all the Kung Fu films, right. you know? Like the top, all the top rock styles, like all those Puerto Rican b-boys back then, they watched all those movies, you know, Jackie Chan movies, Hong Kong films. Mm -hmm. They learn swipes from those movies and probably yeah. windmills too. Mm. I feel that. Yeah. Um, ooh. Uh, do you hear that or no? Yeah, I do. Okay. I think they're gone. <laughs> it's probably from Zoom. Maybe a little bit. I don't know. That's I'm okay. Just... I'm trying to think if I right. should just. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. No worries. Hold on. Maybe I should turn this down. I don't know. Maybe we just have to <laughs> IG live this. No doubt. No worries. Cool. I got so an idea. In case y'all didn't know, we were we were trying to record it in uh, two devices, two platforms, uh, which we could still do, but we kind of tried to figure it out last minute. Wait, I know what to do. Yeah. No, I don't. Okay. Because I, I hear myself. <laughs> yeah. All good, all good. So okay, <laughs> so you went you went from from L.A. to uh, New York. Uh yes, I went. From, yeah. No, yeah, no, 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 no. I was raised in the Bay Area, and then oh, I went okay. to New York City for six years, and then I came back to uh -huh. not back back to California, but moved to L.A. and I've been in L.A. for like twenty years now. So Got that's it. why the New Jack Styles thing happened for me in middle school. Mm. That's what made you want to move from uh, the Bay to New York for a school? What made me? Oh, because of college. I, actually, I really wanted to get out of the Bay because I wanted, I wanted excitement and danger. And for my senior thesis, I actually did in, in high school, I did a senior thesis project on women's self-defense because Got I was it. going to New York and I'm like, oh, I better step it up because I'm too nice and just like want to get women smart, you know, and that women's uh -huh. self-defense was mostly judo at the time which is awesome because that was my first like official class that I entered. Before that, I was just messing around doing karate um, on my own, watching Hong, Hong Kong films and joking as a kid, like, oh, Kung Fu was, or like Tai Chi, my dad taught me Tai Chi. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this is so boring. It's so slow, like what, right. you know? And then, and then um, judo was awesome because it teaches you throws and being a shorter, smaller person, you can throw bigger people which is awesome because I never studied that again officially until I became a stunt woman. And then the most recently I've studied Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which ah. is so related to Judo. And so it was like a full circle after doing all the striking arts or like studying a lot of striking arts and mostly Hollywood film fighting. Then I came back to Jiu Jitsu and then it's, it's been Jiu Jitsu, by the way, is fully related to breakdancing. Like uh. after I retired as a B girl, I'm like, Oh my God, found Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm like, this is, directly related to that and all of those floor sweeps all of the control your core strength um ability to do body sweeps and like be on your upper high of your neck for all sorts of things shoulder rocks all that stuff completely relates to brazilian jiu-jitsu which mm -hmm. i heard some of those guys like um, i forgot what crew that was the circus runaways like i think two of those guys became like really into brazilian jiu-jitsu because they're so flexible and they do all that you know rubber rubber neck stuff right. Yeah, so I forgot what your original question is. <laughs> Easy no, to digest. No, trust me, I do the same thing. I go down rabbit holes and I just keep going. 
And yeah, because there's so there's so much we picked up over the years, so it's hard so not much. to. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel you on that. Uh, I guess we were just talking about. Uh, oh yeah. Do, uh, want to go to school in New York? In New York, yeah, that yeah. was it. I mean, I was chasing adventure. I had, <laughs> yeah, I was chasing. I was like, oh my god, New York City would be so awesome to live in. And my dad told my dad's the one who was like, hey, you know, I actually was going to stay in the Bay Area too. That was one option or go to New York. And I was like, oh, I want to live in New York. And dad said, the best way to live in New York is as a student. So I was like, shoot, mm -hmm. I'm on my way to New York. Oh God, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And then I was there for six years and just, it just was a perfect, it was a natural flow. And a, I think being someone who always loved hip hop music and loved dancing new jack styles because i didn't know how to break dance back then mm -hmm. i saw it you know i saw it i'm pretty sure but i just didn't i don't know and then loving acrobatics loving gymnastics loving hong kong films um loving just the culture of hip-hop all of that together is like a natural progression to becoming a b-girl uh, and then on top of it it saved my life like word. because it's so hard because it was so hard at the time you know what, I will admit, I was doing some crazy things you do when you're in college because you're around, you know, you're like substance abuse, whatever, you know, sure. just trying things. And I, once I found breaking, I was like, forget all of that. I need to keep my body so pure and so clean so mm -hmm. that nothing affects me trying to get this windmill. Because of course, yeah. when I first started breaking, I wanted to get the windmill, like the first trick, I mean, big trick I wanted to do. Of course, I learned all the other stuff, but I wanted that windmill so bad. And I knew that like, if my body fell off, from like any kind of substance, drugs, whatever, I wouldn't right. get the windmill. So I quit everything, cold turkey, it's so amazing, it's so powerful, and then I realized it, this is like such a powerful culture. It's mm. not just the dance form, it's the culture, it's the love. Going to clubs and like seeing all these people dance and really dance for the love of the dance and not go there to just like grab people's asses right. was amazing, you know? And then and that, going yeah. to these clubs to not just get drunk and pick up on, whatever opposite but like really going right. there to fully have a conversation a non-verbal co dialogue within a cipher or mm -hmm. you can just yeah definitely so you've definitely experienced i mean ev you've been to uh, many different places been to different clubs of course spending uh, a lot of years in new york a lot of years in la you really got to experience that and i'm pretty sure you made your way up to the bay and checked that out as well yeah uh, but, during but you mean while i was a b-girl yeah Yes, yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. That what so, is that group of people that I forgot that flew me up there? Raul, like cool, cool Raul was like part uh -huh. of the. Oh, I can't remember the name of them, but they flew me up there to, I think, teach. Well, they flew the sirens up there once to do all of us. We all performed and teach, and then a second time I went alone and then taught a workshop, and then mm -hmm. another time I did some other workshop, and then also went up there to compete or just go to the events. It's awesome seeing up there. Yeah, I love it up there. Yeah, that's dope. Uh, what would you say from your earliest memories uh, from New York, getting that early experience in uh, in college, and then moving to LA, which we can get to why in a second, which might be an obvious answer. Uh, club wise, what was different for you from what you observed? From the clubs between LA and New York? Yeah. Wow. Okay, let me just remember New York club. So New York clubs back then, I was really into drum and bass, crazy. Okay. And I think that was also because a lot of the b-boys were into drum and bass because yeah. a, a drum and bass beat is kind of like a hip hop beat, right? Yeah. A slower hip hop beat. And right. so that's actually where I would go religiously. I'm, I was working a full-time job after college, but I would go every Monday night until like 4 a.m to this place called Concrete Jungle. Ooh. And a lot of b-boys would dance there, a lot. Mm. And there would be people like rolling on ecstasy, all that stuff on the side. But but yeah, it was really gritty in New York. I would say you would find some of the dancers also at raves. So there was definitely raves that I would try to find, but you would see some of the best dancers there. And then, then there was Twilo. And there was this awesome club called Twilo that um, Madonna's DJ, DJ that, and like, uh -huh. uh, okay. yeah, and on Saturday nights, it was the biggest, you could get in if you got in before midnight, because New York City starts at midnight, right? Like, you don't, you don't sleep yeah. until like 11am <laughs> on a Saturday night, but 
the parting starts at midnight. So if you go there before midnight, you get in free. Otherwise, after midnight, it's 20 bucks. This is like 20 years ago. But that night, uh, Saturdays at Twyla was like every kind of race, sexual orientation, size, every type of person was there. And that was awesome. That was like, I think that the equivalent, the first time I've seen something very equivalent to that, or close, not very, is somewhere in West Hollywood. Can't okay. remember the name. Have you been there? It's like, they have drag queens perform in West it's Hollywood. Good. I've only been to one spot on. Like, yeah, like on Tuesdays, times. they have lesbian night. And on Saturdays, it's like, not anymore because of COVID. But uh -huh. I think it's, dang, what is the like Abbey? Range. No, is it called the Alley? The Abbey? The Abbey. Yeah, that sounds familiar. So Yes, in West yeah. Hollywood, there's this club called the Abbey. And that's the first time, I'd say like 15 years in of living in, in Los Angeles. It's the first time that I actually noticed something was similar to New the New York City vibe. Because in okay. New York, those clubs, they're so big and so many different people from, there's people from, I'd say, like every country at those clubs at the time. Like every race, transgenders, every kind of sex, sexual orientation would be at these clubs like 20 years ago. Everybody was like rolling or maybe not. And then a lot of the dancers would be like ciphering and stuff. But then I didn't ever see that when I came to L.A., Oh, Vanguard actually was the closest thing. Like open, what's that called? Uh, Deep House Night? Ha Oh, God, we're nice to see you there all the time. Deep, yeah. yeah. So Deep was the closest thing to New York, but still it wasn't It wasn't like New York. New York's like gritty, grimy. There's like, you know, they had this club called the Limelight. I don't know if it mm -hmm. still exists, but it was an old church, like a ancient, not ancient, maybe 1800s church, and yeah. they converted it to a club. And you're, you're in this club and there's like, you know, beautiful, beautiful tapestries, but people are doing drugs and there's all these crevices and corners where people are like making out and whatever and just, right. but then people are dancing and it's like a church. And yeah. it's, it's incredible what new, and also there was another club that was made out of a meat factory or yeah, it was a oh. meat factory. So it, when you're down in there and you're going to the back and you're walking through like where they would normally hang all the meat. Wow. You know, like the ice chest. Yeah. yeah. I forgot what that place, but that's what was interesting about New York was all the different types of clubs. Also in, in LA, I never saw anything like Monday nights. Um, what's the place that we recently got, went to? <laughs> Dang it. The most recent place that all the partner stuff, like all the salsa dancing and every style of dance. Oh, um, that, um, God, I'm so gonna, close to my Sasha's going to kill me. I'm forgetting Monday nights. If yeah. somebody is logged on and remembers the night of that club. Oh my please. God, I've totally I'm forgot. I'm so embarrassed that I cannot remember, yeah. but. <laughs> um, hold I know on. Where, I know exactly where it is, too. The floor! Oh, it's called the, the floor. The floor, dude. Okay. Dude. Yes. So, okay, the floor in Los Angeles was probably to me, out of all the 20 years I've been in Los Angeles, the most epic and romantic and beast and just dope ass club ever yeah. i loved it that they would start the night with uh sasha doing a a burlesque performance which was uh -huh. always super sexy and then every and then they'd have live music so people would just get on the mic that was never seen in new york i'm sure like as i've left new york they've probably done something like that but that i thought was so beautiful and the most beautiful thing about that was because I think as a B-girl, there's some point where I'd always have this quote, like, where's the romance in street dance, right? Because back in the days, in the 70s, I heard that they used to do the hustle, right? The hustle is partner dancing. And, and now, of course, it's come back now with New Styles hustles. But back then, in the clubs of New York, they, they, in the 70s, they did the New Style hustle, and people would go out and freestyle and partner dance, and it was very mm -hmm. romantic. Until at some point, they started to break away, right? And then yeah. we have Brooklyn with the top rocking, you're not touching each other. And then right. the B-Boys came and take the circles. Like there's a lot of history, of course. But I always thought the news, that the idea of the hustle was so awesome because it was romantic and it was street dance. And then, then there's Lindy Hop. So there's always this, this expression that um, the Lindy Hop crew says, or not the crew, people say is before hip hop was Lindy Hop. And Lindy Hop started way back, right? when um, they were doing Charleston and it became hit Lindy Hop. I think it was 1928 when they first called it Lindy Hop because of Charles Lindbergh. Yeah. But Lindy Hop was a street dance back then too. And, and that was partner stuff and that was freestyle and it was awesome. And there was clubs in New York that 
people started dancing with uh, interracial dancing. It was the first time that that was happening in the 30s, where mm. like Hollywood stars would go there and mix and mingle with all kinds of ethnic ethnicities and races at the speakeasies. So mm. actually before, before I would have loved to see that back then, but right. there was a lot of clubs in New York that we could go into that hosted those type of events way back then, which was awesome. So yeah. what was I thought? Lindy Hop. So then Lindy Hop. So then you have Lindy Hop, right? And then that is kind of like a separate scene than the B-Boy scene. And that's why Min, one of my best friends, Min, he met me at B-Boy Summit and his um, girlfriend at the time, Karina. And then they started Lindy Hopping in the B-Boy Cypher after I threw my set down. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. 2001, right? And that's when I was like, I already knew, because I was already swing dancing separate. Like I always took swing dancing separate in New York and then by B-Girl Life separate. And when Min and Karina threw down, like it's the same rhythm. Lindy Hop steps are the same rhythm as hip hop steps. So when they threw down so hard and killed it with the air steps and like aerials and tricks and like on the beat, I was yeah. like that, I'm doing, I'm doing that. And so Min is like one of my brothers from another mother. And then I incorporated obviously that into my genre of things that I want to do. Um, so the floor, was so awesome because they brought in every style of dance. It wasn't that they brought it in, but they encouraged us to bring, like I was part of the, I think you were too, weren't you? Like part of the first group of people that showed up there and started bringing in other dancers. And, you know, it was like. I wish I could say that, but I think I, I was probably like that second group of people that. Oh, like, okay, oh, okay. That so, sounds cool. You know, yeah, like, they gave us me. like a free um, list of people we could put on yeah. our list and they would get in free. And so every style of dance came in, like salsa dancers, tango, like bachata. It was so mm -hmm. sexy. And to me, I was like, finally, after all these years of going to these hip hop clubs and seeing people soloed, and it's sexy when you battle. If it's a guy and a girl battling, it's, it's kind of sexy. There's an it exchange, be, yeah. you know, yeah. it can be um, like, especially funk styles and all styles battles when that started coming up in LA later, because I didn't see that in New York. I know that that happened in New York, but I was part of like when the all styles battles started coming around and that was so awesome. I love all styles, but I love watching it. And so like the floor, I felt like that was the epitome of that. It's like everybody's bad. A couple would battle a solo B-boy or like a B-boy and a B-girl would battle a couple doing Lindy hop or, yeah. or salsa or, but all of that. And that's just sexy. I've never seen, that. the floor was definitely the most epic club to me. Mm. Um, Maybe uh, for the new generation, and, and I brought this up with other people in the past, but maybe your perspective could be even on a deeper level. Um, maybe a lot of the new generation does, doesn't understand what the purpose of battling was about. Um, uh, everyone has a slightly different uh, purpose, but yeah. overall, like you can, you can name a few um, that are not necessarily why you do it, but you just can absorb it and be around people and, they tell you why they do it, or you just feel it. So, um, you know, people of my generation uh, and, and um, older, uh, you know, they've experienced that. And then there's like a cutoff a little bit below me to where the new generation, uh, they're, they're geared towards competition. And that's what they perceive yeah. battles. And they're just kind of hearing it like, like it's some kind of folklore or something like that. Uh -huh. So maybe you really? can explain yeah yeah it's oh my kind of god rap. okay yeah and then there's some hardcore young kids that really listen to the ogs and then they go there when everyone else is like what's your problem right because they don't understand oh so, interesting. Yeah, yeah see i'm kind of out of the scene right now so i don't know what it's become but like i definitely yeah. feel like i feel like i lived in the heyday of some of the best b-girls in the world best mm -hmm. meaning not just technically best but culturally and spiritually and personality wise like yeah. the ones that really loved and were like down to go to every battle and or like travel internationally and teach and be like live shit and sleep being a b-girl you know right. uh but as far as like battling that is so that's like such a beautiful thing so you know the unspoken like um not you know ver what is it called non no dialogue conversation yeah. that you can have in a battle is what is really beautiful and there's so many different versions of ciphering and battling because that's, I think that's why they called it sessioning and ciphering because sometimes you're not like out to kill and just have the attitude and I'm gonna kill you and diss you and in every possible way, even with my mouth, my look and my, my, my moves. But 
in in a club setting is somewhere like where there was no camera back then that was yeah. like the most beautiful and epic i'd say conversation dance conversation i've ever had in my life all with sometimes alone and then sometimes with another b girl or a b boy or a bunch of girls or just a bunch of people those were like the most beautiful and epic moments and of the exchange and of like you know and then there's all the biting that came in with 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 um competitions but like in a cipher it's fun because who cares if you see the guy do something that kind of reminds you of something that you do so you mm -hmm. kind of one up him but not really one up him you do something and then you add something to it or do something that reminds you of what he did and then it mm -hmm. it's like he inspired it's like a direct he inspired you to pull out and remember oh yeah i have something that kind of looks like that and then i'm going to yeah. do this and then he looks back and he's, he acknowledges oh yeah i see what i see how that kind of related you know and that I felt like that was beautiful because if you don't say, if you just train by yourself in your own house all the time and you never cipher, you're not experiencing that. You're not experiencing like hyping each other up, you know, uniting to hype each other up, instigating um, the conversation and pushing each other. Right. Because sometimes I think people, yeah, I think people get caught up in the competition where they want to enter the battle. They have these planned out sets and that's it. But, that's why if you see, to me, some of the best B-boys are the ones who watch their opponent. And then if they really, they're like, oh, yeah, I do have something. They do something to one-up, make it better, but then add on to it. That's like, that's magic, you know? Um, and, yeah, and it's like when it is a girl and a guy, there's a flirting conversation without talking. And it's yeah. so beautiful. It's so fun. And then that's where it ends. And maybe, maybe it becomes your boyfriend. Maybe you have a beautiful romantic day with them. Maybe you don't, but just right. that moment that you share that dialogue, it's so awesome. It's something that I think every dancer should experience, but a lot of, I get it, a lot of the new, well, I'm not sure if I can say this now, but I have heard that people are not into freestyling as much. And I already saw that happening. Like there was always, you knew your freestyle dancers and then your dancers that just did choreo and did the one, two, three, four stuff like this, you know, the same pattern they learned in class, which yeah. is a whole nother study that I completely, I completely respect and it's amazing, but, but also like freestyling is like where it's at is letting the music flow through you, mm -hmm. enjoying the music to the fullest. Do you know like where those hits are, those accents, the words? Yeah. That's like the beauty is like seeing, seeing people like rock out, you know, in a club to songs that they know to each other. Yeah. Yeah. I miss I, those I would times. Say, yeah, definitely. Me too. Um, I think why the new generation is missing out on that, um, yeah, the competitions are the, the biggest factor for sure. I see. Um, also, like having routines, right? Yeah, either. Like routine, I mean, there's still routines routine. about dancers, but uh, they don't connect, and they don't connect for various reasons. One competition, but also the they don't. I mean, not now, obviously. Like we keep bringing back. Of course, COVID is the issue, but there was still clubs before COVID but people weren't connecting like they used to. And it's like, yeah. well, why is that? And there's, there could be many why, factors. Yeah, why? tell me why is that? Cause I haven't been going yeah. anymore. I, I mean, I think, we still I do at our part, small parties we do, but like, yeah, that's sad to hear. It is, it <laughs> is. And I, I think it's just that um, there's a disconnect because if, if they're a freestyle dancer, not just the average club goer, uh, they're used to, like you said, training at home uh not right. connecting with people they're having a different purpose right so right. competition or making videos we're always doing this now right yeah so this is this is their goal uh they want they want views they want this they want that because this is what they grew up with you know they ah. were right so totally and then music doesn't really i don't feel like the music really inspires people to other than doing some of the dances you'll see like some of the newer social dances or, or the right. stuff you see on TikTok, right? Because they that's, where, so that's where everyone's going, right? So yeah, it's, this is it's what they like know. Chore, this is it's just like they... choreographed lip syncing. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's really because of those reasons if I had to, uh, you know, put a finger on it, is there's a couple different reasons. And uh, I think stuff like The Floor um, and even like, those instances in New York where you just had people from everywhere of all walks of life, some dancers and some not, it was one of the most beautiful times that I can, yeah. I can remember because 
it made the dancers stand out, of course, a little bit more and more appreciated. If you're always yes. around dancers, sometimes if they're not about vibing out with you, they don't give you the energy. And, and then you can't elevate as much as you possibly could. You know? You're right. I did love that there was like people who just came to drink and watch. And then yeah. they, they created a show with us too and had us perform. So they made like a live show before the whole nightclub and then invited people to just dance if they wanted to. And there wasn't always like technical dancers there, but there was definitely a lot too. So there's no pressure. And that was also the thing too. I like that as, as us being professional at the time, break dancers or dancers going to the floor, there was no pressure. If like, you know what I mean? You can just throw it in like, it's okay if you throw a set and you're just enjoying the music, but you're not rocking a head spin or like doing like something crazy. It's fine because we're just feeling it. Yeah. We're just feeling it. I loved watching the, just like the different styles battle each other. I loved watching like a girl kill it in the whacking styles and then versus a B-boy any day or a crumper versus a yeah. locker. Loved mm -hmm. that. I thought that was awesome. The mix and the dichotomy and like, the contrast of the styles of dance and the styles of people that arrive like that's that's so awesome mm, feel that. that's that's a bummer to hear that that's not happening anymore though i mean well right. pre-covid pre-covid but you never know what can happen later hopefully when things clear up and we're gonna want to be together even more and we're not going to care so much about perfection or who's yeah. watching or cameras like hopefully we're, we're fed up with cameras at that point and they'll still be around people will still shoot them but it's like maybe God, you'll put so that phone like, down back then we didn't have i can't believe i'm talking like as if we're like old school now because i never thought <laughs> i was gonna get old school but we didn't not everybody brought their phones to record at clubs just sometimes yeah. not really it was like you'd have to bring a camera to a club yeah and then download the footage later but People weren't like all like, you know, it was like we were just we had we couldn't record. So everyone's like really living in the presence and connecting to the music. Yeah, yeah and that's a big thing, too. I think yeah. to add to what we were kind of adding to the pile of why things have changed. That's just that energy of distraction, you know, right. uh, just having something where it's like, what am I going to do with this so other people can see it? And, it's like yeah. yeah the living in the moment aspect it's a um you know doing that back then was a moving meditation and that was mm -hmm. like everyone's therapy and i think yeah. even you know because because vanguard or deep was on sunday nights everyone mm -hmm. would call it church like oh I'm, it, yeah. it looks like a church like oh i'm right. going to church tonight mm -hmm. but yeah it was like a moving meditation because you can't record it's too dark to record in the cypher anyway nobody had phones and so you're there and you're there for like whatever a couple hours just dancing it your heart out <laughs> yeah and i guess yeah that was what was so beautiful about that i miss those days damn uh, you man. have to have them at your house now well actually right. you know i heard there was a couple of events i heard people had you know during black lives matter and stuff like that and mm -hmm. um um like for small parties that we've had like wendy she when rock everybody yeah. knows b-girl when rock she hey. had a birthday recently. It was very small. There was only 20 people. We all mm -hmm. were pretty safe. And she rented out a place in Palm Springs. And then yeah. we cleared out the, the center area. It was like a mansion. We cleared out the floor marble area. And we, we made a roller skate rink. And then yeah. we also danced like almost every night. And that was, it felt like old times. You know, we had a DJ. <laughs> it was that like, was damn, I miss those days so yeah. much. And Scotty had a birthday too recently. And Yo. We, we kind of got down there yeah we kind of got there too and there was a pole there so i actually wendy and i started pole dancing first and then that became a huge scotty everybody house dancing cypher and mm -hmm. then i just saw everybody in the room like man we, we miss these days you know yeah oh man so well, it's crazy. good that you guys got to feel some of that you know yeah just a little yeah. bit but i re i mean that's why i think well, for me, that's why roller skating has been so awesome because you're mm -hmm. doing it outside. So it's a little safer with this COVID thing. But, um, you know, it, it's very difficult. Roller skating, you're like at any second, you're grooving out. But at any second, if you just balance <laughs> off or something, you are wiping out and wrecking yep. like a stunt. And so, but the awesome thing is within the last, I'd say two months, like a bunch of the dancers that I've known are all into roller skating now. So they've mm. been like, go, we've been going to the spot in Mar Vista and um, they have a real DJ there, huge speakers, 
it's mm. all open door and like the the rink is like smooth and so at least we're able to like express ourselves like val pal just got roller skates too so she's gonna start roller skating too hey, and, oh. and there's places to skate at the beach and you can skate like you know at um tennis courts at parks and stuff like that so i i see a lot of the dancers like noel beltran's getting into that duncan nice. is into it they're like all like getting addicted and roller skating like, i've been sort of doing that for roller dancing for a, a while but like i started at five five years old when i first started roller skating but i'd say the last couple years i really started getting into roller dancing because i retired break dancing and just you know i love i've always loved roller skating so so I've been doing this, but it's awesome. Just COVID alone, like now it's sold that roller skates are like, there she is, Val Pal. Yeah, I can't wait to skate with you, Val Pal. She's hey like, yo. she got her skate. She's going to come out and we're going to, oh yeah. I can't talk about something. Dang it. Okay. No wait, there's something, <laughs> there's something that we're going to do soon. Yeah. Skating wise. Cool. Um, yeah. Looking forward like, to it. Yeah. You would be awesome at roller skating because it's like. You would think so, but I. I, yeah, can, like <laughs> it's. I'm still trying to figure out how to lock on skate. Like Sarah Von Gillen has um, and I have been slowly unlocking because um, melding the two worlds. Like you, there's there's your artistic skaters, you know, who come from artistic background, kind of like ice skating, and then there's your hip hop dancers that get into mm -hmm. skating, and it's different. It's different backgrounds, but uh, to unlock the moves, because you know, with locking, you have to plant. With whacking, you're planting your foot, right? But yeah. with roller skates on, you have no base. So you either mm -hmm. toe stop or you have to figure out your weight for when you do these things. So I'm yeah. still like figuring out my locking and my whacking is a little bit easier in certain po poses. But yeah, it's it's been fun to what Sarah Von Gillen calls it is unlocking uh, whacking moves and locking moves with roller dancing. Mm. And then house dancing too. House dancing is completely related to roller skating. So I think that's why like people like, you know, Scotty likes it. <laughs> yeah. For me, I've been horrible when I was younger at roller skates, roller blades a little <laughs> bit better, but still not that great. And yeah, and skateboarding, skateboarding, rollerblading, like none of that stuff I was very good at. I fell a lot. So I just kind of like did See, that. It's, but yeah, it's for whatever the reason, I think hoverboard for me is okay. Uh, oh. Maybe it's the weight, because <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, switch yeah, yeah. my weight as a pop. Yeah. And then yeah. you can flow with it too. You can wave yeah. on a hoverboard and you can exactly. dance and you can groove and like, yeah. yeah. And I like playing with twist flex because that's really easy. Oh yeah, to totally. Do. You can do the. Yeah, yeah. So it's fun. That <laughs> on fun. the hoverboard. You can do yeah. that on roller skates too. Once you, once you figure out how to spin on roller skates. True. That's so funny. You have a hoverboard. Yeah. Yeah, actually. You yeah, still ride, of, uh, do you still tail. ride that around? No, no I wish. <laughs> I still I have wish one I can too. Go outside more. Yeah, 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 yeah. I still have one too. I heard you can buy this little attachment, and then it it make you make the, your hoverboard into a go kart. Wow! I I saw it last Christmas, and I almost bought it, but I didn't. But because I don't yeah. really have anywhere to go kart around my house, but um, maybe I might get one for my nephew or something. But yeah, yeah if you still have a hoverboard. Really, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So. Yeah, let's get back to your story a little bit. You know, this okay. was, but that was that was really dope. That was really dope. Um, so what made you move from New York to LA? Okay, so well, that I mean, that gets into my career. But yeah. I always knew that I was going to come back to LA. When I was little, I loved coming down to Southern California because I loved Disneyland. Ah. I know. Why did I love Disneyland? Because I really just love the experience that they would create for you. So, you know, we went to things like, oh, Trudy. Okay, Trudy right here. That girl yeah. was one of my first, like, dance little sisters in New York City. And we were part of a group called Urban Impact. What's up, okay. Trudat? Um, I've heard that before. Yeah, and so Urban Impact was created by this guy, um, Mark Santa Maria, and he's still teaching at Crunch Fitness in New York City. He started mm. our crew, Urban Impact, from... Um, I think it was a culture shock. They were part of culture shock and they decided okay. to break off from culture shock and start this thing called urban impact. And we would go perform in like, just for kids all over the city. And Trudy was my little sister and she, and we would dance all, she was a really good dancer. And she went to my college as well. So that transferred from then. Um, and then she's still there right now, killing it. 
What's up, Trudy? That's crazy. Okay, so, uh, wait. So why did I move? Oh, yeah, my career. So I was a computer animator working in New York City after college on architectural design using 3D computer animation That's and dope. fly throughs to for architects to develop and pre viz the buildings. And um, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but, but I, I was trying to figure out how to get back to California because I hated the cold weather as much as I loved uh, New York so much. I, my family's in, in California. My family, my sister was down in, in uh, I think Huntington beach at the time. And I knew I had to get back somehow. Uh, so the opportunity came up for me to start with this company that was working on the matrix at the time. And they were doing uh, animated storyboards. It's called previs for VFX. And somehow I just, I knew this guy, Ken Seki, and he, he and I connected. He was very athletic. I was very like, I think I was one of the few people at my company at the time that was really into going out to clubs at night dancing after I did a whole day of work. Right. Mm. I was just always like break dancing behind my desk while they, like on my break. And I just was kind yeah. of like the black sheep at this, this nerd place called IO Media. I hope they're not watching. I don't care because you know what, <laughs> they started me, but, but um, they definitely, I was definitely weird to them, you know, like, mm. like they, I would stay late to work and then I would break dance and then I'd go out late dancing and then still come to work in the morning and all this stuff. But mm -hmm. opportunity came up. I went to, I just dropped everything in New York. I had started the sirens in New York already. Like we were already existence in maybe a year where we'd go to clubs for free. It was like yeah. me and like six other girls. I can't remember, five girls. And then I just like dropped everything. I'm like, I'm going to LA. And then mm -hmm. in LA, that's why I came. But immediately when I got to LA, I looked up Asia One because I had seen VHS tapes of um, what's it called, B-Boy Summit. Yeah. And like, you know, Ken Swift, I saw Ken Swift on VHS tapes. Mm -hmm. um, but Asia one and Honey Rockwell too. And so I, and I even saw, actually, I think I even saw Honey Rockwell later after I moved away from New York because she wasn't like in New York at the time. Mm -hmm. But back then Rockefeller, I had hung out with Rockefeller and then I was like, peacing out. She's, I think she told me to look up Asia one too. And so immediately I looked her up, went to all the events, went to all the practice spots, like Hope in Hollywood. Do you remember that? Jeez, yeah. Hope in Hollywood um, and Ju and juice and no juice came later homeland yeah and uh that's what brought me to la is is the movie industry to work in the movie industry so even in my first job i was like still going out and back then i didn't even have a car at first so i'd take a bus to hope in hollywood from venice because that's where the the thing was and yeah. um go to practice at night and then go to my real job and just not sleep a lot and then still go out to <laughs> try to go out to the clubs, you know, it was yeah. fun times. Was I was going to ask you when you first started talking about that and dancing all night and going back to work, Not on good. average around that time, <laughs> how, much, how much sleep were you getting? I, I mean, I think like six hours max. Like That's maybe good. Four, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Like you can still pull it off because if you, if you stay up to like, I mean, occasionally i would stay out till three or four and then you'd still go to work at nine so but it, it's not good like i think i wasn't a coffee drinker but i definitely drank green tea but i don't uh -huh. think it's good for you i don't recommend anybody to do that i just i just really loved dancing i loved going to the clubs i i just enjoyed it so much even if you're not talking and you're just there dancing all night and like flirt dancing or just dancing with friends too it's yeah. like it fulfilled my heart so much so much just as if it was church, as mm -hmm. if it was a religion, you know? And yeah. then at the end of the night, I could sleep so happily and then go to work mm -hmm. so happily, you know? But if there was like, I think I committed to quitting for two weeks. I quit dancing for two weeks because, uh, yeah, <laughs> I think I was in a relationship that, uh -huh. you know, I was young okay. and dumb and like, I think a relationship was like, encouraging me to just try staying home and going to home right after work and cook and just just try that right so mm -hmm. i um i was like okay like, let me just like not kind of laid out as the typical relationship scenario yeah yeah and it wasn't yeah. like he ever said don't do it but it was like hinted it was kind mm -hmm. of like not supported that i was a b girl and that i, I had a b girl name you know he's mm -hmm. like why do you call it anyways 
but um mm -hmm. you know that's gotcha. just young stuff it's okay and and <laughs> basically i quit for two weeks and then i went crazy and i never felt so angry and and just stressed out in my life that i was like forget this i'm never i'm never gonna quit again and then also mm -hmm. that's when i started going out to salsa clubs too and like going to steven's steakhouse and like uh -huh. what's a place in 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 santa monica oh it's so awesome i forget it it's like some at the end of Santa Monica Third Street, there's a every Tuesday night. I think there was like a salsa night. Mm, okay. So I would do that, and then also go breaking, going off to all the clubs. There wasn't a lot of clubs that I knew about, but there were some occasional ones. Uh, yeah, LA was fun. I was B Boy mm. Summit was like a big deal every year. Freestyle sessions was a big deal every year. Yeah. Um, I even made it. I don't know if you ever went to B Boy Proams out in I Florida. I had the opportunity. I missed it. But you knew about I, it, right? I, I just got into popping in 2004. Oh, okay, so okay. I, I, like, just missed all the cool stuff. Well, no, because Freestyle Sessions was still around, and so was B-Boy Summit, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, B-Boy Summit 2004, maybe 2005. Yeah. But definitely one of those, yeah. Yeah, we had, like, yeah. some of the best events in L.A., like Out for Fame. Mm. Like, it was such great events, yeah. I was like so stoked. It was like a double whammy moving out to LA from New York with my career as well as the, the dance industry. It was awesome. <laughs> so cool. So you made that move? There we go. Oh, there we go. Hey, cool. Uh, so you made that move, uh, started working, started, you know, just doing what you do. Was there ever some kind of transition from Yes. The job you were doing into just dance. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, okay. at some point, you know what? My first industry job was actually while I was still a computer animator on, <laughs> it was called, uh, okay. So the movie that I was doing, I was animating racing cars for Fast and the Furious 2. Mm. I was either doing that or Van Helsing. I can't remember. But at some point, I w at the same time, I was starting to go to the Groovaloos practices you remember that yeah. at oh, um yeah. broadway dancer some place so i'd go to right. Blues um on thursday nights and then i think my first gig was somebody referred me i don't even remember maybe it was lady jewels because i was i loved lady jewels one of my favorite b-girls in the world she's in colorado right. she's from colorado and now she's back in colorado but she was my partner my battling partner for a while too and she preferred me to do a background dance job with Pink at the Billboard okay. Music. And that was 2003. So that was my first industry job. I don't think I even had an agent then. And then after mm -hmm. that, that was like, I opened my eyes to, hey, maybe I should on the side start auditioning for stuff as a B-girl, right? But still being this computer animator. And I definitely feel like it was, that, it was hard to try to hustle both. So I could only dance at night and then auditions I would miss because I'm working a full-time job, right? So at some point, I'd say around 2006, 2006, I'm getting like so exhausted from being a computer animator because they, you know, it was sometimes just a flat rate, no overtime and no residuals like you do as an actress. And you're just working through the weekend, maybe 10 to 15 hours a day and just feeling really old. Like after <laughs> you're sitting a whole day every day, I felt yeah. older than I do now, I think back then because wow. you're sitting at a computer, staring at a computer, your eyes are getting stress, fatigue, carpal tunnel syndrome. And then mm. I would still go break dance, but there's only so much offset you can do, right? So yeah. my body started feeling really bad, I'd say around 2007. And at some point I was like, ah, I want to do my laundry. I want to be, I just want to just be home cooking and do cooking things and dance, you know? <laughs> and so I think at that point I took a, um, Gosh, I took my first, I got my first stunt job too. During that last 2006, I was working on Spider-Man 3 at the time. Mm. And I got one day or two days of stunt work somehow that, through that whole hustle, which is another story. So then mm. I was like, all right, I'm gonna, guys, bye guys, I'm gonna go do this job. You don't have to pay me for two days, you know? And they let me do it because I made it up on the weekend. And mm. I went and worked my first stunt job. 2007, I was on my very last movie. It was National Treasure, um, and there was I was animating cars, and so I was like, oh, I booked somehow booked a national commercial as a stunt woman, 
And, and wow. then I was like, I can't pass this off. So I took off work. They let me take off work for that one day and also go on my lunch period to audition. And then it was um, me in an office geeking out. And then there's a hurricane. It's a farmer's insurance commercial. And I, okay. I made some good money on that. So I was like, hey, maybe I should just take a pause from um, this computer animation job and just see what I can do, right? So I, I stopped. I like it was like freelance job to job at that point and then okay. I was like let me just take a break right so I took a break and I was hustling hustling stunts and dance and I was mm -hmm. like I gotta do this let me just try let me just try right I saved money I didn't have a lot of money saved money and and just went for it and then also I was getting called to go battle and fly out to different cities all over the United States and some countries to perform or do like a music video. Like I got flown out to do a music video in Italy and then flown out to just do perform at a live stage in Spain. It was amazing. Like being a B-girl was, I didn't know that it was going to allow me to travel the world to compete yeah. and, and also teach and perform in so in front of so many kids that like later came up to me or wrote me emails like, hey, I, I break dance because of you now. You know, I saw you perform at my school and now I break dance. And that like meant the world to me to hear that. Mm. I was like, wow, if you can just inspire one kid to start dancing from your five minute throwdown at a school, that meant the world to me. So that's why I was always down to take those jobs. And also at the time, that was the only thing I was doing because I quit my job. So I would take every job that was, if it was 50 bucks, 100 bucks, a free job just to hustle, whether it's dance or stunts, you know. So I was mm. hustling the both once I quit the animation job. And then I really wanted to travel the world. And I felt like, do it now while you're young, right? And do it in yeah. this way where when you go there, like in Germany, I met these guys. I was actually traveling in Germany with my friends. And I met these B-boys who were actually doctors. Or, or like they were, not doctors, they were studying PhDs. They were, it was so interesting in Germany, like the, uh -huh. the difference of the cultures, right? But I met yeah. B-boys who were studying for their PhDs. And they were so awesome. And then I met this guy, Shoko in Salzburg, the, the city where Mozart was born. And he was so like holding down the the whole hip hop community in, in this Salzburg, right? Mm -hmm. Without him, there would be no events, no. He basically threw this event where people from all over Croatia came and battled in Salzburg. And I happened to be there that day. And so I entered the battle with them. And then they were like, hey, do you want to come perform at a, at a club? They paid me 200 euros, which is pretty mm -hmm. good converting, right? And then, yep. um, and then she's like, how many more days are you here? I'm like, I don't know. I'm here for, for like one more day. He's like, we're going to put on a workshop. So they threw a workshop for me and then like 300 euros, like all the, like 30 people came to learn how to t I just taught top rocking. Cause I teach at the time I was teaching top rocking in LA and mm. it was just so much love. So like in, in Europe, or if, if you travel out to other countries from Los Angeles as a beagle, I felt I was like, oh, wow, they give you so much support and love there. And that I wouldn't have been able to do if I stayed with my nine to five job. So I knew mm. that I wanted to experience these things, you know, and then and then I got flown. Me and Wenrock, actually, me and Jules were um, called to go perform or not perform. Like it's kind of a performance when they like fly you out to battle, but you're yeah. also battling to win. Uh, right. And then Jules couldn't do it. She had a performance or something. And then I brought Wenrock with me. So we got to go to Australia and that was amazing. Yo. Um, and then me and Emiko went to France twice, I think. Emiko had her connections. It, it was awesome to like travel yeah. as a dancer. There's like some ghetto moments, you know, like they get, they feed sure. you pizza and give you one towel in the, in the hotel. <laughs> but like, right, for me right. it was the, yeah, it was like the experience that was awesome. So... That's yeah, what a journey. And then I just never went back to my real job until 2016 when I injured myself in stunts and I hit wow. them up and I was like, hey, can I, I, I don't want to animate, but can I edit? Because I always edited through my entire dance career. If you're a dancer, you should edit because you'll learn a lot about music. And I mean, most dancers now edit, but like if you don't right. edit, if you're a dancer or a stunt person or someone who, a movement artist, you should learn how to edit your own stuff just because you know your your best movements, but also it teaches you so much about performance, camera angles, timing, music, yes. all that stuff. So I've always edited for like 20 years or more and edit all my demo reels. And those, I will attest that those demo reels that I put up in 2005, 2004, 2003, 
Those, mm. That's why that guy Sodi Productions in Italy even noticed me because he just wow. saw some YouTube video and he's like, would you like to fly out and do a video in, in Italy? I'm like, hell yes, you know. Uh, of course, I cross-referenced and saw that Shi-chan from Japan went there first. But but those were the, the things that I felt were so so precious is is to be able to travel as a dancer you yeah. see a different you see the world in a different way and then if you don't speak their language again there's that nonverbal connect connection where any country you go to and then you dance it's like it doesn't matter if you don't understand them they don't understand what you're saying but the the dialogue through your movement is like a whole conversation and that alone is beautiful like i i feel like you know i'm glad they still have like international battles online now like i heard I saw yeah. that there's some, right, that they're doing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, now more than ever, it's, it's so important to connect. Um, and that was one of the best parts, international. Uh, international conference. battles, yeah. Right. Just debut. So, I never sure. went there, but I saw you know, it. I went in 2012. And you did yeah, to just debut? Ah, yeah. oh, that's so dope. Yeah. That's so dope. It's, it was crazy. And I, I, I forgot who I just spoke to about this. Um, yeah, someone I just recently talked to. Uh, in 2012, it was at the Bercy Stadium in Paris. And so it oh, seats 17,000 so awesome. people. Yeah. And there was 18,000 people. And I'm like, wow. Yeah, yeah. Just to have, because it's all Wait, did primarily you compete dancers. there too? Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to, because my partner ended up booking a gig. Uh, long story. <laughs> but basically, we didn't get to enter. I, I just like, entered with someone from Spain. Yeah. yeah, but I was there. You know, that's so it was awesome. Really cool. Yeah, that's so awesome. Yeah, that's they do it differently in in France. The two times I battled in France with Emiko, it yeah. was like stadium setting. So, uh, or actually, half one of them was like um, you're in a boxing ring, like up literally on a boxing ring, and there's stadiums all surrounding you, and then the other one was like you know, a huge stage looking down on this stage. And yeah. it was like so, I was just like, wow, there's that many people here who paid whatever, 30 euros to watch right. American B-Boy Cruise versus European B-Boy Cruise battle. It's, I wonder, if, I mean, wonder if that was still going on later. But I mean, I still keep in touch with like Nasty Ray. He was like, he actually Nasty just Ray. competed online. Yeah, uh, I saw that. He was that's, hilarious. Like, that's the only thing that I watched recently and I was like, that's sick. He, he's still like holding it down. He was always one of my favorite B-boys, him and Nagin. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, yeah Nagin, yeah, yeah. because Nagin the... mixed everything, every style. And then Nasty Ray mixed every, like, you know, tricking and footwork yeah. and flavor and style and B-boying and creativity and musicality all together too, so. Yeah, I like he really stuff. embodies the music well. Yeah. Yeah. New school that's... style B-boying. And still, Definitely. like, still improving, you know? Yeah, that's it. Cool. So, all right. So, about 2016. So, along the way, was there, like, any, like, particular moments that are so memorable as far as, or we could do it like this, memorable moment or moments in your dance career in the industry, and then same yeah, when it yeah, comes yeah, to yeah. The free dance or even the club? Underground, right? Yeah. Um. Okay, so I think... I think in the club, like, God, that most epic times in the club, because I don't even know if a group of girls like this, like my girl, the Sirens, and yeah. are the Sirens, and then also girls that were like the Sirens, like maybe like Marie Poppins, or like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the girls that were friends with all of us too. Like, yeah. there's never, I don't know if that still exists, but going to clubs and like with that many epic girls, because there's always right. great dance guy dancers. There's always amazing guy dancers, both b-boys and then funk style dancers. But going okay. to clubs with that many epic girls mm. and like throwing down and then like sometimes when there's like battle of the sexes, it's like those are the moments I never, I will never forget because it's mm -hmm. just so magical to see that energy and have these like fierce badass girls come out and be like, no, we're, it doesn't matter. We're going to, we're going to represent the way we do. And even though you're doing a different style and you're killing it with like, whatever power moves or whatever it is, girls yeah. would still like throw out their sass, the attitude, the personality, the flavor would come out. And those, those yeah. are things that I miss so much and I will never forget those nights, mm -hmm. like repping with the sirens, like 
or even like my crew outer circle well outer circle became my company later but outer circle was like sirens girls with some of the b-boys or with Min, mm. the lindy hopper which we would throw all styles and you even represented outer circle like in you, Vegas, I hired right? you. yeah that was, that was a, i guess within my my career i really think that that's memorable too is creating outer circle to be a, a performance entertainment company that i could hire my friends and also perform with my friends at mm. rich people's parties weddings bar mitzvahs anniversaries yeah. um corporate events product placements vegas like those were epic moments oh yeah you were part of the weren't you part of the big um flash mob. Plan versus i would say that was the biggest most memorable job that one and the disney um tron job but the plants versus zombies flash mob that i produced in vegas is by far the biggest job i ever produced with like 50 people right or so i think yeah. it was like 50 dancers with so much choreography i hired three different choreographers to help me and two producers to help me P pas that day like but they were all my best friends like janet yeah. and lauren and like and then That's all my dope. my really like you got to dance in it like all of my good friends got to perform in it and that was so fun and they in the gaming industry they had money to to take us out at night to eat afterwards mm. the event itself we killed it and we made a video of it i love that that was definitely unforgettable and everybody yeah. had a blast too right yeah. Um, yeah we had a great time yeah, even after too. even after before during after everything was great yeah the rehearsals there was rehearsal yep. beforehand that was awesome and then also i would say when we my crew won uh, the Disney. Oh, that's Jeff Johnsrud. That's from high school. So, Jeff, so Jeff Johnsrud. What's up, everybody? That's Jeff. Oh, yeah. So he's wow, just going. Jeff, 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 um, Jeff from high school is probably one of the few friends that still keep in touch with me. But he, he literally witnessed my. I guess hi, Jeff. He witnessed my um, love for hip hop dancing back then, and he would actually at the clubs dance with me. Not the clubs. The, no, we went to clubs together after college, after high school and even during college. But he also watched me love dancing in high school and he'd always be in the ciphers with me. So that's Jeff Jones. Um, oh. Dude, back to the question. I see why you do <laughs> IG Live now so you can see who comes up. What's up, Jeff? Yeah. Really? Oh, oh, shoot. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> Jeff has been watching me blossom into who I am today since I was probably, I don't even know, 14 or something. Who's that's that? It. Jay the Wild Child? Yeah, oh, that's yes, yes, that's yes. Miles' is, uh, father and yes. legendary hip-hop. No, we love Miles, MC. of course. Yeah. No, I, Miles, I, I bet he's grown up now. I've been watching his his crew. But uh, yeah, the sirens, I'll never forget the siren all the time. There's, You know what? With my dance life, there was like so many moments. The yeah. Disney, um, winning Disney Tron, I guess that's an industry job, but that was epic too because we didn't know that we were going to like battle to go to the next round too. So we, we enter the competition. We're some underground crew. We're not even a crew that like um, was on ABDC at the time, Outer Circle. We, we made this crew for Tron. And I, mm -hmm. made, I, I hired a lady to make all of our costumes. And then I just love Disneyland so much that like we, uh, Gyro, uh, he edited the music with me. Every night after rehearsals, we'd go back till 4 a.m. and nitpick the routine so that every hit was on. So that mm. routine was like so much love. Like we wanted to just make an amazing performance. We did not know we were going to win. And we actually battled like We Are Heroes and Poriotics and, and like big crews that were on ABC. Yeah. But I think Disney lit us so well. Our costumes were like we had those glow, like the sirens uh -huh. costumes, the white ones. And we just mm. like had every style of dance in that routine. Sarah Von Gillern, um, we had Jenny Keita. And Jenny is like an amazing dancer who was dancing with uh, Gwen Stefani and Madonna, amazing choreographer herself. I had an all-star cast. I had Christopher Troy, who's now a stuntman too. Mm -hmm. Oh, Beto, Beto is online. And he, that guy, Moon Cricket Films, I don't know if you know him, but he's from the Bay. He started roller skating where I started roller skating, I think Golden Skate, right? And um, he he's an amazing roller skater, but also a legit B-boy and funk styles dancer. So he's one of the few people that I see kill it on roller skates so yeah. hard that I don't, I'm still working to get that way, but he's been obviously like committed to both the whole time. But I knew him for years, like probably, 
I'd say like 20 years as through the, and then he, he comes down to LA to roller skate all the time, but check out him because he kills it. He waves, he locks, he top rocks and b-boys on roller skates. <laughs> and he's so good. And he's like old school style. And I like that. Like he loves funk, funk music. Um, maybe I might be tripping. Maybe he can correct me, but I'll always remember a video on YouTube, especially the earlier days of YouTube. I believe it was him who put it up. It was uh, a video of what's his name, Diamond D, or wait, he's smiling. Diamond Red, something like that. Uh, Probably he, he's, he's been like making a, videos forever. He's like an OG. <laughs> And uh, that's one of the illest, illest vibes of, of a dancer from the old generation that I've ever seen. Really? And I, when I see Moon Cricket, because that's like the intro, it's like swirling and then it hits like some kind of animated pose. Like, oh. uh, he says, it was, yes, red. Yes, red. Hey, okay. can you yeah. link so us that, that Beto, link us that afterwards or send me a DM, please. Yeah, that's, that's like one of my sick. favorite videos from the OGs ever. Ever, I, ever. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. Diamond D, yep. That was Diamond him. D. There we go. There we go. Well, yeah, he, he's he been making, putting up, he's also a film, op, you know, he, he makes videos and he's a camera operator and a DP and shoots awesome stuff. But we keep missing Later. each other. He keeps coming to LA and I keep missing him. Ah, oh, man. It yeah, happens it, for sure. It'll happen. It'll happen at some point. Word. Um, that, I would say, yeah. And then did I say, so? yeah, I guess. I don't know. There were so many moments like in my dance, like I had a great B-girl life. I would mm. say like going to B-boy pro on, I would say like battling the two on two when, uh, when Lady Jules dressed up as Uma Thurman and I dressed mm. up as, um, I don't know if you were there at, at B-boy summit when we did this, it was like the two B-boy summit, bless her heart, Asia one. She always threw a awesome event and I think it was still going on for a while. And she'd mm -hmm. always have a two-on-two B-girl battle and like people would come internationally because it was the only way you could face international B-girls at this event, right? Otherwise, you're just yeah. hearing about them or seeing it on YouTube. And so she wanted to do a theme called the Tarantinos. She was always down for like the movie theme. She definitely yeah. inspired me. So she dressed up as Uma Thurman in the yellow outfit. And then I dressed up as Gogo Yubari. And I had like yeah. a ball on the chain and I came out and like, we battled and I think we lost, but everybody loved the show. Like mm -hmm. B-Girl Beta was one of my favorite um, B-Girls from Florida and she was judging. And I think she was like, you know what? You guys were smooth. I loved, oh my God, Freaky Flame. What's up, Freaky <laughs> Flame? So all these people still follow you and watch this. Uh, so Frankie Flame, let me talk about Frankie Flame real fast, man. Go I'm gonna probably start forth. crying. I'm gonna start crying, I think. Frankie. <laughs> I don't think I ever told you this, but you inspired me so much as a B-girl and um, just those countless nights at Homeland where you freaking were so patient with me and taught me sweeps. Do you remember those times, Frankie? <laughs> but like, uh, I don't think, I don't know, maybe I never thanked him back then, but I'm thanking you right now. He is so awesome because Frankie Flav, the man, hilarious. Frankie Flav, um, God, he was such a great guy. Like he really, he really supported, I think, he, you know what? He wasn't afraid of coming up to B-Girls. So sometimes at Homeland, <laughs> like guys, B-Boys wouldn't come up to us because it's intimidating because there's not a lot of, there's always like tons of B-Boys and then just a couple of B-Girls. And Frankie was always down and not in a like creepy way. He would come down and hang out with us. And I met him through Asia One, which was awesome. So I was lucky that I, you know, I got to hang out with Asia One and the baby and Frankie. But Frankie, like later on, just every part, there was like so many times that he helped me with learning sweeps and just moves even like that. I even named some of my like, you know, when you write down your sets and stuff, I would name some of my moves. Frankie, mm -hmm. Frankie, go down or something. Okay. Um, so, yeah, he's awesome. He was such an awesome. And he, he just had a great charisma. He and his brother, Ronnie, his smile. I was really inspired by Frankie played. I think he was like sort of to me an underrated b boy. Well, um, not in when not when they were all part of like California and stuff. Like that was man, that was one of the favorite my favorite crews is watching them with Stilo mm. and then performing all their like creative routines with Donnie. Yeah. Those were the times. Oh, I wonder God. if he heard that though. 
Frankie, did you hear that shout out? You can always send it to him after I post this. I'm you tell him. Send it like, hey, watch this at this time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, yeah, dude, yeah, that yeah. was, I think, like, he was so great. And you know what's funny? When I first met him, when I first came out, I think it was, it was where I was coming from. Because you know how when you interpret people's, like, actions, you, you, like, I think I was, like, insecure. And I didn't like him at first because I thought he was making fun of me because he'd always be like, he'd come up and cipher with me or in a cipher or come to the practices and he'd start like, no, 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 do this, you know? And I'm like, dude, this guy is intimidating. I don't know what it is. I don't like him. He doesn't like me. He's making fun of me. But then it, like later as we became friends, I'm like, oh no, no, this guy wants me to be better. He wants mm -hmm. me to improve. He's, he's adding to me, you know, he's helping me. He's actually helping me because in breaking, like back then we didn't really have, we didn't have classes to go to. There was no classes like we were all each one teach one and so you're learning like i learned from some of the best b-boys and like po one was another person i loved alien ness like asia like i learned from i'm like a conglomeration of all those amazing b-boys from the past even ken swift because i was like a part of the red bull beat riders group there was two seasons of that they they not hired they um me being in the industry is always like hired but they picked 30 people you could apply to go to this Red Bull Beat Riders thing. And, and were you part of that too? No, no. unfortunately you weren't. No. Okay, so Ken Swift, and like, I love Ken Swift so much. I loved watching videos, like old videos of Kenny. Because he also yeah, looked too. like he was inspired by um, Kung, Hong Kong Kung Fu movies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Back when he was younger, he would put like, you know, in his top rock and stuff. Yeah. So um, Cobra stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I loved watching Ken Swift. And, and then meeting him at Beat Riders was amazing. And for him to teach, like, some footwork, it was like, wow, you know? So I just felt very blessed that I was able to learn from old school people like that and hang out with Zulu Grimes, too, and learn stuff from yeah, him. Cool. Yeah. That's uh, awesome. So much history. Something that I, I thought about a couple minutes back. Uh, maybe, maybe you can deliver a message, if you will, because uh, okay. we were talking about female crews and okay. I always I always felt like yeah I wish a, a more people let people know how 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 not just like strong but even high level and just the mental approach to battling no matter who's in front of you whether it is female female versus female and just not giving a fuck and just going straight at the men too uh, because there is always yeah like some kind of intimidation uh, Absolutely. From, from the male side of things. But I always appreciated that when I saw that, because I felt like that's how you break down those barriers and that's how you can create an equality in this particular atmosphere. So maybe for like, uh, maybe the new generation of women that might be listening, maybe you can kind of explain your, your mental approach whether it's natural or it's something that you acquired over the years. Well, that was not natural because when I came into this dance form, I was learning from boys, you know, and I, I'm shaped differently than all the guys. The guys have bigger upper bodies and small legs. And so when I was learning things like swipes or any of it, it was very, very challenging for me. Even me coming from an athletic post gymnastics, post springboard diver background, martial arts, breaking was freaking a whole nother thing of your core strength. It was just a whole nother thing. So I, I came in learning from b-boys, even though Rockefeller showed me some stuff, but most of the time I was in the clubs with b-boys, so I'm learning from b-boys. So I, I'm trying to emulate them. I didn't know, you know? And it wasn't until, it wasn't until like, God, I wanna say like 2000, 2005, did I really, not, not even, like maybe 2007 or 2000, beginning 2005, I started to develop my own style and like mm. really, Conf like I was a b-girl but there was like I think mentally I was trying to just learn really footwork I was learning like foundation I was respecting the art looking at the old school b-boys like really just trying to to figure out how they move that way so I didn't really commit to being I would say like a, my own style of b-girling until like starting mm -hmm. 2005 and then mm -hmm. 2006 and 2007 and then like I would say I peaked out in 2010 but for as far as that there was definitely moments i remember the transition of when i would always get shook like like i'd enter one-on-one -on -one battles all the time just to train because i always used to feel like as a dancer you have to train a couple different things you have to train 
I wanted to train battling. That's it's you can't train by yourself and then someday battle. You have to actually right. enter the battles and entering the battles and losing is part of the training, right? So you lose. I loved losing because when you lose, you always think about like, what could have I done better? You learn, you, you gain a strike. So mm. in battles, I definitely got shook. I'd be like, oh man, I got to battle this guy. I saw him at the last battle, just kill it like hard, right? right? And that would kind of just screw me up sometimes. But then I learned eventually, I just kept entering battles. That's one thing is like, keep entering the battles and know that you are different and that this is an art form. So ultimately, yeah, the judges are going to judge based on what they like and what they think is is right, right? So when I even started judging, I judged mostly like I would know, sometimes I would know the dancers, but I'd know if they're hitting their stuff, right? So mm. if they're not hitting their own stuff, which is really technically difficult stuff, but this person is hitting easier stuff, but hitting it hard to the music and like live and you can see their soul come out, that person, I would, I would choose them i would vote for them and so that's that's something i learned from entering battles is like it's not about like that person's definitely going to have degree of difficulty 10.7 and you might have degree of difficulty five you know but it's really about like how do you rock your own stuff and i think paul one even like said that to me because he's he's judged a lot of battles i've been in and i'd always ask him hey what could have i done better you know and he's like do your thing man do your thing focus on your thing because you're not going to be able to do air flares you know mm. everyone the crowd is going to like always scream for an air flare or a flip if you can't do a flip in an air flare or a head spin you rock what you can do correctly and if you can listen to the music that's even more points right mm -hmm. and so then i started experiencing this um not only do you win battles on on hitting your own stuff but it's also like endurance and stamina and your fitness right because at these events we would battle first round, right? If you're doing a one-on-one -on -one, and then you'd wait two hours, cool down. And then you're like, right. oh shoot, you gotta enter the battle. And you're waiting for all the other events. And now we're in semifinals. And now it's like 9 p.m. And then you're doing semifinals, right? And then finals at 1 a.m. in the morning or 12, right? Yeah. So right. how do you last? That's where I start, started studying my diet and nutri nutrition. I was always studying it, but I happened to go to Sedona, this lady, she gave me a, a massage. She was, um, she was like, you know, giving me a massage because I was sore all the time from breaking. What's up, yeah. Christian? <laughs> My friend Christian, he's a film fighter, actor guy. He's on. So oh, nice. she's, this lady's giving me a massage and she's like, wow, you, you have all this yeast in your system. You know, like why do you eat a lot of bread as a kid? I'm like, yeah, I ate bread and pasta all the time. And she's like, you all should right. look up your blood type because it uh, just check it out and see if you are a typo and she thought i was a typo sure enough i was a typo she oh, told I'm me to typo. read this book you're a typo okay well yeah. she told, told me to read this book called eat right for your blood type and mm -hmm. you're supposed to eat red grass-fed organic red meat as a blood type o to maximize your everything your potential of healing yourself so there's like three groups of food the first group is like highly beneficial everything in this group of food in this list is foods that could heal you if you're like very sick so for uh -huh. o types they say red blood i mean red meat and spinach um okay. broccoli there's things there's a whole list right nice. i don't follow it to the t to this day but i definitely did there was a time i just wanted to try and do it and sure enough the first battle that i entered uh out in Arizona, remember they would throw that event. There was a one-on-one -on -one battle. Dang it! What is it? God, oh, I forgot the name of the event. But I What's entered the a. Again? Uh, there was two. There was another one-on-one -on -one B girl battle called Out for Fame in the Bay Area. So both of these events, I ate a steak that morning, and okay. people would be like, "What are you doing? You're gonna, you're gonna have the worst digestion." And I was like, "Dude, I've been doing this for a month, two months now, whatever." I just need to stick to my blood type. I can't eat those energy bars because those energy bars slow me down for some reason. Mm. I cut wheat and dairy out of my, my diet. I ate a steak in the morning. And sure enough, I was able to win only because actually that one in Arizona, I was battling my best friend now, Wen Rock. Back then she was not my best friend, but she and I made it to the finals and I won only because of my endurance because I ate a steak that day mm -hmm. and at 12 midnight when they finally got back to the finals because we had to do one three rounds and then yeah. the finals was like 12 midnight and I still had my stamina from that big piece of steak in the morning 
So that's yeah. the only reason why. Because she has, she's amazing, B-Girl. Um, but I just had a little more energy and, and she was gassing out. I don't know what she ate, but definitely right. she was only gassing out on her skills. Like she and I have totally to this day, we have different skills, style set, everything. Um, but there was that. And then there was Out for Fame. And that was when this B-Girl movie won. She's such an amazing B-Girl. I don't even know if she's still breaking, but at the time, I was like, oh my God, she's going to be at this event. Holy crap. And I somehow made it to the finals and I had a battle movie one at this, at this finals. And there was only one round, like both, like first two rounds were great. And there was one, her last round, she's doing difficult, like halo to heads. I don't know, something, something technical, really difficult stuff. Yeah. She had a lot of original stuff and she just fell out of it just probably because she was tired. And I just yeah. had so much energy that I like blasted whatever my thing was. And so then yeah. that one, I was like, okay, that's proof that this works. And so that mm. was twice. And so from then on out, that's an example of like, that person is technically better than you, but you need to have the endurance to hit your stuff properly yeah. in the battle. That's what it comes down to, I think. And also like, have the your own style. Yeah. Have your own uh, style. So, so for you, because I think that's a common thing that a lot of dancers think about when th with these long events. Um, everyone has their thing. Sometimes they find it. Sometimes they never understand it. Um, so you you figure, okay, I'm gonna have a steak early on. Yeah. What do you do throughout the rest of the day, though? You don't. Nutrition. You you're just, you just basically in ketosis. You're like you Got let it. that steak fuel your body. So yeah. that 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 concept that I found in 2006, I took that with me through my stunt career. So to this day, if I, and it sucks because actually I like fasting. Now I found fat in the last four years, I found intermittent fasting, which is, yeah. which has actually been really amazing. It's a whole nother journey. But yeah. um, I feel like if you have to work on set or if you have to do a battle the whole day, it's better to eat in the front of the day and then just let that food disperse instead of, or you could do the reverse and fast. Because if your body's not in a state of ketosis, fasting yeah. is like, so gnarly so it's better to just eat that big steak in the morning and then the rest of the day don't eat because the digesting is what slows you down and makes you tired right and yeah. takes the energy so you eat and then wait two hours four hours ideally because that's when your body can pr process meat and then by yeah. four hours you're good so that's mm. that's what i've experienced and it's not yes. like i loved meat at the time it's just i wanted to do what this book said and I, it's sure enough i feel the difference when i when i do it if I eat really good, clean, grass-fed, organic meat with mm -hmm. spinach, I can last the whole day and be like, mm. and have that extra oomph. And I know yeah. this because I've done tests where I've eaten like rice. And I love rice because I'm Asian. And I'm mm. like, oh, I'm sleeping, like wanting right. to sleep. The same effect that rice has on me has is alcohol. Alcohol, like I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I, I don't drink because I'm, I think I'm allergic. No, I'm pretty sure 100% that I'm allergic because I get the red Asian thing, my whole splotchy and everything. Wow. You know I mean? So yeah. um, the same feeling I feel when I eat, when I drink alcohol is what I, when I eat wheat bread or, or when I um, rice and I'm so bummed. I love rice. So yeah. you will not see me eat rice before a huge job or if I have to compete or dance all night, perform or mm -hmm. anything like that. So off the top of your head, because I'm pretty sure you have it somewhat memorized, but not like on the spot. Off the top of your head, would you say the blood type based off the book uh, is pretty much like things based off of the diet of uh, is it, keto? Uh, you know what? No, because no. for an A type blood. So my dad's an A type. My sister's an A top. A type is supposed to eat vegan or vegetarian. Actually, the whole book, I don't stick exactly too because i love avocados and i love coconut mm. and that those two things are supposedly poison to o type blood i need to check the list but that's what okay. the last um update it, it is so uh but dairy for instance dairy is supposed to be bad for everyone in that book right. according to the book and what the the doctor did he basically put your blood with the food to see if it forms something called lectins mm. and lectins prevents digestion like causes disease cancer, all sorts of things. Oh, so yeah. and it kind of makes sense because I feel like when I started eating for my blood type, I started to feel better. But the main thing was like my performances. 
I could perform yes. and just like have that endurance, that extra, that's like living proof, you know, that if you can last to the finals at 12 midnight after the whole day of being at an event, that, that blood type is working. So, mm. so yeah, that list of food is not necessarily keto, but for O type blood, it seems to be closer, closer. Yeah. Cause it. the, and then I basically, I don't just do the blood type diet. I mix the low carb and keto ideas to that. Yeah. And, and um, not just keto, it's like paleo because I still like fruit, you know. So mm. I mix a lot of those concepts. I learned, I just study nutrition because I need to feel good when I perform. And or... so I mix those ideas. So I'm generally paleo, but occasionally I'll eat a grain. Like I like rice here and there. I love rice. I'm Asian, you know. I love sticky <laughs> rice. I love rice crackers, but I'll, mm. I know that if I'm going to do that, I'm going to fall asleep. Like during Christmas, I eat like rice, whatever. They'll make yeah. rice, like gluten-free things for me and I'll fall asleep. But yeah, keto <laughs> for me generally, if, if I stick to, it's really hard to, but if I stick to straight keto with no dairy and no greens, then I have a lot of energy. Gotcha. Trim down, yeah. girlish figure, work on my girlish mm -hmm. figure. Hey, oh, feel that. <laughs> well that's that's cool so that's good for anyone listening um just yeah. to study nutrition in general you got to find what works for you just like even the book itself uh different blood types different things right so there's not going to be one exact way uh, there's some common things but yeah what works your, for your body, body type. type yeah yeah that's very like, cool for me you know i think the blood type even says you can have rice but for me for some reason i just got uh -huh. I got unlucky and I, I don't feel good when I eat rice. Such mm. a bummer. It's such a bummer. Um, but wait, really back to the importance thing about like the women yeah. today when you're feeling threatened by battling guys, like mm -hmm. just, just forget all that. Forget all that and just know that it's like such a, it's so fun to battle guys. It's so fun and bring what you have mm -hmm. and bring your own style, your own flavor, your own thing. Know that if they're going to throw like power moves on you, that doesn't mean anything. And I think, Along the way, there's been so many hilarious, there have been so many, um, I think some really influential b-boys who would tell me that, you know, and be like, whatever, just do your thing. Because yeah. uh, I feel like back in the day, like even 2004, 2003, when I'd go to those like outdoor battle, random outdoor battles, and I'd enter the one, there's like a random one-on-one -on -one car show battle or whatever, and I'd battle some guy. And I remember at some point, my mind switching and being like, I know this guy is so good. He's so good, but I'm going to just shake, I'm going to shake him down with my confidence because I know how, I know how to throw my stuff. I know music. And I think I won on that. I think I won on music mm -hmm. and just the confidence and execution, execution, style, flow, musicality can beat power moves any day because the guy was throwing power moves at me. This is way back when I was like, yeah, not into, I don't know, just very inexperienced, maybe 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. And he was just throwing a bunch of air flares and like air swipes, windmills, head spins, like amazing stuff to no music at all. And I was like, oh. I did like, I did technical foundation. I top rocked, I danced, I hit the music. I was like showing that I had a fun time. And then yeah. I was like, I beat him. And that was like the first time I was like, okay, that's how, mm -hmm. that's why, this is what's the beauty of it is like, you go rock your thing. And if the judges don't vote for you, because clearly that day, the, the crowd loved that guy. The crowd loved his flips. They loved his windmills. They loved all the power moves. So they were like, he, he got so many props. But the judges, they usually are hiring judges that are like experienced and dancers and whatever. They liked me better that day. I don't know. And I didn't even know them. At that point, I'm kind of still new in LA, whatever. It wasn't like, yeah. it was like clearly, if you look at the footage, I would have voted for me too. Because he was like throwing hard stuff, but not dancing, and right. it's a right. dance battle. So that's the, that's the tip I have for girls: is like throw your style, your flavor, your sass. You can still win in in judges' heart, and it, even if you don't win, who cares? Because you had a great time, and then the audience saw that you had a great time. So a battle, losing or winning, you're still having, you're still performing, you're still sharing your art with the world. You know, you're still yeah. like making a statement. It's it's still worth doing. Yeah. You know, even even from a, a flip side, this is from, you know, from a male perspective and going to events and battling. Like, if women back off, 
or intimidated and they're, they're not showing the best of themselves, the men can't learn from the women either. True. It's true. You know, and I, and I think there's so much that women have in their dance that men could be inspired by, uh, whether it, whether it is because there's different, um, you know, body type or something that comes a little more natural to men or natural to women, those differences, like we, we, we're we missing out on that if women don't step up and be themselves. They hold back. Yeah. Don't hold back, ladies. Just freaking mm -hmm. go all out. Just go all out. Just throw it all down. Put it all out there because that's what makes it awesome that it's like you're throwing a different style, a different vibe, a feminine energy, whatever it yes. may be. You know what's cool? I just had a memory too. Pop and Todd. I, I wish he would. Well, actually, hopefully he'll watch this later too. But Pop and Todd highly influenced me for like waving mm -hmm. and popping and all that stuff. I mean, you did too, for sure. And then Frantic, for sure. Um, but Pop and Todd was so into the new New Jack styles that he saw mm -hmm. me doing. So like, he, and he loved house music. So we would yes. go to deep, and he would make me teach him New Jack styles. And he would get That's it, he cool. would pick it up too. And it was awesome to see him. He was an amazing all styles dancer too. Like mm -hmm. he would enter the all styles dance battles, but it was amazing to see him mix that into, I guess it was more flattering to me that he was inspired by me because to me, mm -hmm. he was like already amazing. And I was like, what, you yeah. want me to teach you stuff? I, like he was teaching me waving and whatever. And so I was like, wow, okay. So that's like an example of like my style of bringing whatever I had, he wanted to learn. And then yeah. he definitely like put it into his stuff. Like his style, I saw him like freestyling and he put his new Jack style into it. And that was like, that's awesome. It's freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. oh, Todd's amazing. He has a very special, um, I mean, just him being himself is, is perfect. Yeah. It, it yes. just kind of brings out, it makes you feel comfortable about opening up to be yourself as well. Like I probably the, one of the best sessions I ever had was right here in my house in like 09 with him. And we, oh, we like, yeah, we shot. That was when he uh, was like coming down like a lot, right? Hours. Say again? That was when he was coming down from Oregon a lot, right? I think this is right before he moved up there, actually. I think this Oh, is... shoot. Well, he yeah. was my boyfriend. Okay, so he was my boyfriend in 2008. Okay. I can't remember. Maybe it was 2009. And then he, I moved, <laughs> you know, because I was there the day he moved away. Like, he like, oh, okay. said, said goodbye. So maybe it was 2008 to 2009. Yeah, yeah. somewhere around. There. Yeah, yeah. That yeah was we, my... we had like a three hour session. Yeah. And I had the footage. I don't know where it is now. Oh, I had it, shoot. But... You need to find that footage. Yeah. But he was really on, at that time, he was really getting into Miami. Like, already his robot was high level since like, 2006 Forever. he was already on that robot vibe like high yeah. level robot but yeah, yeah, yeah. i think in yeah 2008 or 9 is when he started uh transitioning more into like uh, a lot of concepts and miming and doing that kind of stuff so that really made me be inspired and move differently at that time so that was a really cool session wow three hour session yeah, that was right yeah. remember he i remember like he was really close with wave matic yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. r.i.p Yes, uh, yeah. I wouldn't be waving. I wouldn't like that's a whole other thing we can get into for sure. I know. Like, oh, that'll be another hour, but Wave Omatic was uh, one of a kind as well. Yeah, he was awesome. Yeah. He was yeah. so awesome. I saw footage from like Todd and Wave, Wave Omatic at his place. And... Yeah. Wow, Crazy times. See, so oh. much history. <laughs> too much. This too, too much. much. Talk too forever. much. Yeah. Um, all right, so. Maybe we can, let's do this. So Wait, we, so we Instagram kind of lets you talk for two hours now? Now you can, yeah. It used to oh, be one hour awesome. blocks. Yeah, and then just recently I found out because it went over the time and I warned them, I'm like, yo, uh, I think this is going to time out. And I checked the time and it was already like yeah, seven minutes over. 9.30 is two hours. But, oh yeah, RIP, wave matic yeah, yeah, so I, I think what we can do is Later on, we can, so for you nerds out there, what you can do is record <laughs> this on IG, but you can keep the, they'll give you the file, right? And then you can yeah. use that audio and put it on the Zoom. Because we have a video okay. of the Zoom, so you just put, lay, you know, and I'll do it, don't worry. Right. I'll do it. In the Worst case scenario, we could always screen record off of IG, because it will yeah, upload to IGTV. 
but All maybe you can even directly download. I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No biggie. Very well, how, how have you been, though? You've been okay? Quarantine? I mean, now, yeah. I'm good now. Uh, mm -hmm. I think for most people, they had a journey this year. Yeah. Um, just to sum it up real quick, as I've said it a few times, but you haven't heard it. Um, so very first week of, of uh, the year, my dad had a stroke. And uh, yeah, so there was just that whole thing of what do we do? You know, luckily he survived the surgery. He survived, he's alive. Um, but then, yeah, like what, now I'm a caregiver. So it's like, what? What do I do? Oh, and then what wow. does he have to do? What does he, what does he pay? Like, what is this? What is that? Like, just all these things that I never knew I just inherited. And I don't have the information because maybe he can't give it all to me. So I have to like figure out a lot of things on my own and on the fly sometimes. Wow, that's your right. journey right now. Yeah. And then I started taking him out um, because he actually never went out for a long time. He stayed home all the time. And uh, I started actually taking him to dance events, which was really cool. Amazing. And, right. And then he he's like, yeah, I want to go to all of them. I was like, what? okay, we're going to all of them. And then uh, he's like, Amazing. Well, you're not in? yeah, I know, right? It's so cool. He, like, he loved it. And then people love seeing him for the couple events that he was starting to go to. And um, yeah, and then I entered a, a battle because he said, how come you're not entering? I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess I guess I could practice or something. So uh, me Wait, and, is uh, this the first time he was going with you to any of the events too? That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Kind of like the very first battle I ever won, he was there. So that was wow. in Las Vegas. Yeah. We were in Vegas just hanging out and someone invited me over. And they're like, yo, there's this battle if you want to enter. And I told my dad, I didn't think he wanted to go. He's like, yeah, let's go. Do they have somewhere to sit? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, cool. I'm down. And then, uh, and then I won my first battle. And since that point in 2009, he never seen me uh, live again to battle until That's this cool. year. And so, and wow, that's so, yeah. see, so dance he, that's is a, healing him. Dance is yeah. healing him. I think so. I think so. That's so um, beautiful. Yeah. But that then, is so powerful later, and beautiful right there. See, you can heal yeah. your parents. I actually right. have a story about that too. My dad. You want to share? Yeah. So, okay. okay. Because it's directly related to isolations and popping. Mm. I'd say popping mostly and like, yeah, isolations. So yeah. Um, my dad almost died of Guillain-Barre disease in China. What so it's a rare autoimmune disease that he caught. So they find that uh, people have it from Mexico and China, and it's a bacteria that looks mm. like our antibodies. No, it looks like our neurons in our, in our body. So what happens is when you inject, maybe you eat something, you touch something, touch your mouth. And when most people get paralyzed from the neck down, right? So my dad uh -huh. was on a, like vacation with my mom in China. He ate, he thinks that it was a fish head that was raw. Um, so everybody mm -hmm. like eats the body. And my dad yeah. used to, when we were younger, just joke around and be like, see, I can eat the head. And we'd always be like, ew, dad. Like yeah. his whole life, he could eat so many different things, right? And not get sick. So now he's 71 at this point. And this is a couple years ago now. He eats the fish head and he just gets like Montezuma's revenge. like. He's just excrementing it out of everywhere. And then he starts, his face starts going numb and he thinks he has a stroke. So they go mm. to the hospital in China. My mom, like luckily she can speak Chinese, but he's now not able to talk, you know, and it's going, it's happening pretty fast. And yeah. then they, she somehow gets him into the hospital. At this time, the hospital's being remodeled. It's in China, like nobody speaks oh, English. Uh, There's like, yeah. we didn't have like, I don't know, this 2016, it wasn't as the, the, the internet thing, whatever, 2016? No, maybe it's 2013. I can't remember now. 2013. So, uh, so then I get this email like, hey, dad's in the hospital. I go there. I just drop everything, which is another reason like I know my calling was to become an artist because if I had a full-time job and a kid and a family, right. I wouldn't have been able to just up and leave. My sister had a kid at the time, so she was helping with like phone calling and trying to figure out for me how to get to China. Luckily I speak mm. Chinese. I somehow get to China and my dad has this disease that slowly, slowly from here on out, it's numbing his face and it's getting down to here. 
and they caught it right before it got to his lungs and they found a drug, I forgot the name of the drug, but it stopped the, the disease from spreading. So it was just stuck here, but now he's lost all of his function in his face and he can still write and make noise and they can put a tube down him, but he can't talk. But his brain is like, like sharp as head, day. right? Sharp as that, what'd you say? Even to this day. Oh, right now it's he's fine. So that was a whole journey. Oh, okay. Is the healing? So I was there for two weeks, like helping my mom, letting her sleep, and helping him, like take him do the thing, all the caretaking things you do, and it was really scary. But um, we had to fly home on first class, crazy flight, and then they, he's in another hospital. But basically, in the hospital, the first day that he was like able to get out of the bed and sit up, because he was like laying down the whole time, they had to turn him. Yeah. Um, the first day I, I basically would massage him, but then I was like, I brought my, my phone or something with the speaker, my phone, and I played yeah. music. I played mostly mm -hmm. funk styles music because of the hit, hit, yeah. hit, right? And I had yes. him, I'm like, dad, you hear this beat? You're going to move your head down and up and down. And like basically awesome. taught him physical therapy because he couldn't see his, his whole thing was numb and he couldn't talk back. He could only talk to me with writing right? This wow. disease numbed his whole face. And he and it was amazing how sharp he was. But we had such amazing conversations through this whiteboard he had. And he mm. would go like this because he couldn't open his eyes. And he'd yeah. hold his eyes open to see and then he'd write and then I'd be like, wow. <laughs> and then we're in a room full of six other Chinese people that have neuro neuro problems. But yeah. I taught him I basically physical therapy led him through isolation. So I eventually had him doing this you know, yeah. and this, this, because his whole body started to atrophy from laying down, right? And then I'd yeah. be like, do your shoulder, your right shoulder, and your left shoulder, and your right shoulder, and then roll, you know, and then mm -hmm. your upper upper body, upper body. And then like, I had him do all of this, you know, all of this yeah. to move everything, like, you know, everything. And I just place his hand, I'm like, hey, do this on the beat, do this on the beat, and then tighten your muscles, and then relax, tighten your, you know? Yeah. And then I had him like twist toe flexing eventually, like, you know, and um, sick, yeah. then when we walk, he finally was able to get out of bed, right? And I would have him do things with his legs and we'd walk down the hall and I'd blast music down the hall, this like Chinese hospital in Shanghai and um, have him walk to the beat, right? Yeah. And that like, in the music, I swear the music healed him and inspired him and dance because it was a moving meditation that got him away from the sadness and the depression of the fact that your whole face is numb and you can't talk and you're almost, you might die, you know, but he was able to yeah. every day get up and like start moving to the music and, and doing popping and isolations and then waving and like moving and, you know, creating circulation and blood through his body that he was able to heal. And finally we could get heal enough so that he could stand up and we could get him back to America where then there was all this other stuff. But mm -hmm. I attest that, I wasn't a physical therapist, but being a dancer, it is physical therapy. And I was able to yes. help my dad heal. So in that sense, you did too. You are too. Like what he's like, his passion to want to come to those events is like, that's giving him something to live for, you know? And yeah. it's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. It was great. Um, yeah. And then, but then, yeah, COVID, right? So Yeah, yeah, COVID. Does one, he still one want to see you dance, though? You should still dance for him. You can make videos. <sighs> yeah, he just sits a lot and doesn't want to do stuff. As much as I'd love to, I'd love him to do more. It's, I can't force him, you know. Yeah, yeah. Wait, what about yeah. leading him in isolations too? Yeah, he gives up. He, but I'll, I'll give it a even shot. with the I'll music, even with the music. Like yeah, what I he, played some music. Yeah. But, yeah. You He's turn like, yeah. on music that he likes. You turn on music he likes, have him stand up, and then just be like, come on, Dad. Come on, Dad. You know? Yeah. It'd be great. I'll, I'll give it, I'll try a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, I should still be doing that stuff because, like, that's what's so awesome about funk styles is, like, you don't have to be yeah. on the ground breaking your neck and, like, you know, losing your hair on top of your head and, like, <laughs> right. killing your, ripping your shoulders out. Like, I loved yeah. going to clubs, and if I was tired of breaking or top rocking, I would just, like, wave on the side, like, hit, hit the beat hit the music yeah that's it's good therapy yeah. it's good therapy definitely i agree i agree but yeah so that's kind of what's been happening and then once i kind of got a handle of things it's like okay i'm i'm home what do i do now 
Like, what can I do here? Yeah. And so a lot, a lot of this year was more of that. So, of course, this was a great first step, doing dance discussions and talking with so many amazing people, including yourself, and hearing these, um, these stories, these gems of information and philosophy. It's been great. Yeah. Uh, that's awesome. That's also, awesome you're doing this, too, because it's like yeah. the history gets lost. That's right. And that's, that's what I cared about a lot. Like, everyone has a beautiful story to tell, and it's like, for the new generation, they can, if they, they so choose, or if we send them the link, they can, they can go through this stuff and find little bits of information that it just clicks for them. Or they just didn't know that this person knew this person. And then two weeks later, this new, this uh, next person who was on dance discussions is totally related to the person a couple weeks ago, right. as far as their interactions. And they start, uh, you know, piecing the puzzles together of, of you know when they weren't dancing when dance came before them and right. i feel like the middle generation has a story to tell and that gets lost because everyone is not going to these sources they're going online to watch videos so they can see what's new and what's next because that's kind of what we're geared towards on social media nowadays i know and the footage nowadays is so beautiful it's yeah. so beautiful like if we had those cameras now back then like wow oh, man. Yeah. yeah i can't imagine like my oh, i think my what a couple of my b-girl reels are still up or my dance reels that are like two for like re, 240 like they're really low resolution but yeah. awesome footage but like not yeah. compared to what we're looking at nowadays 4k footage at some dance studio nicely lit you know it's like right so it's like you're there yeah it's like you're pretty much there yeah totally totally um yeah. so yeah so it's been great ta <laughs> great talking to you and ca yes, catching thank up you. 100 uh maybe maybe uh just to kind of end things out something that i do sometimes is i ask the question to you in this case uh what question do you have for the dance community oh my goodness mm. what question do i have for the current dance community yeah <laughs> Wow. You know, because you know what's weird about like our generation? I feel like it was a big deal to pay respects to old school heads and not just yeah. pay respects. Like we wanted to watch them. We wanted mm. to study and find rare footage about them because there was always some amazing refined like essence about the old school people. You know yeah. what I mean? And if they were going to throw down, it was like, drop everything. I want to go watch this person in the cypher get down, right? And and that was like, I feel like most of the like diehard dance people from our generation, like that was a normal thing about us. Like if we knew yeah. some old school head was going to get in, we're going to stop and we're going to watch because we want to see, we want to see that refined movement. Like I, I guess my question for this new generation is like, Do you guys, ah, there's, I mean, there's a couple questions is like, do you, okay. you know what I mean? Like, first of all, do you guys care about the word dance preservationist? Do you guys understand like where these dance forms are coming from? Do you guys care? Because I mean, there was a point in the beginning, maybe I didn't care as much, but as I got more into the dance scene, I wanted to know history about mm. where certain moves so like when i was a b-girl teacher break dancing teacher every single move i taught i i remember i never lost sight of who taught it to me and what they said about that move like mm. alien has taught me certain sweeps but he learned that from kenny or storm from germany or like poe one taught me stuff from from um a lot of sweeps and he told me that storm he saw he learned those from storm so when mm. I touch my students, I would tell them the whole history of all those sweeps. And then yeah. same with like, there's a there's a, a footwork move. It's just where you're like, you're, you know, you're moving around your feet over, under, over, under, around. Mm -hmm. And that's called yeah. baby love. And like, I would always tell my, my students' names. So my, my students too, they're awesome. Like, it was awesome having students. They're still out there doing like Linda. She, there she is. Linda is Linda is a is a <laughs> doctor. Funny. I had some amazing students that I had like interesting like she's a doctor. I had um this other guy is a computer animator who worked at Disney, a graphic designer, um, a lot of different people. And and 
when I taught them, I'd always tell them the names of things in the history of it so that when they would refer to it, or if I just called it out, hey, do but baby love, they would do it. So mm. I guess my question to the new generation is, do you guys, are you guys even, in? oh, Steven Stanton, what's up? So Groovaloos, I used to dance with the Groovaloos and that was Steven, that's how I know him. Um, so I just, I just wondered if, if the new generation, they care about the history of where these moves from or like, you know, when they make up a new move, like, like the running man was our gener well we we actually what did we call it back we did we call it the running man in the 90s and then yes. later on they called it shuffling right so like do the right. people the new generation the know back. yeah mm -hmm. do they know that like that was called the running man back in the day you know what i mean right, right. yeah i guess my question to you guys new new people is that do you guys care about the history anymore is it just like what's cool and what's hot online um yeah good question to ask yourself i think yeah, yeah. and then like wh like what inspires you like what are you guys inspired by is it like really only the TikTok stuff or are they inspired by the old school because i was definitely inspired by old things that came before me you know and even if like even if i saw something before me and then it wasn't like biting but you get inspired by it and then you make something yeah. that was inspired by that I'm sure. I mean, I mean, I'm sure they're doing that, but like, I wonder if they're really like doing research and look, there's so much footage on YouTube, but do they yeah. even care about those old links anymore? Even if it's bad quality, because I did, I cared about VHSs. I cared, I would like look for every, I collected all the B-Boy summits and even the old ones that I could get a hold of to watch mm -hmm. the old footage to see what was happening back then. I wanted to yeah. see footage of Honey Rockwell. If any mm -hmm. of the B-Girls know who that is, Honey Rockwell was to me one of the first B-Girls who I saw it was like the essence of a B-girl. When I saw her on the um, B-Boy Summit videos, long ponytail, she was just killing it. And she had a gymnastics background too. So she was like very acrobatic, but also like killing it in the dance form and just repping next to the guys, her mm -hmm. and Asia one and Rockefeller. And Rockefeller mm -hmm. is just like the essence of a B-girl too. She is so amazing. She's so feminine and strong and beast. And like, you know, she killed it. She'd always kill it in so many ways. So yeah, I just yeah. wonder, you guys, new people, do you guys look up the history of these moves of like previous dancers? What would you ask them? Shockwave? Me? Like, yeah. Oh man, I ask them a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. Uh, I would ask, yeah. I guess if I had to ask them one. You know, there's a common one that a lot of people say, and I'm going to try to avoid that one, but that definitely just popped right into my head. Um, what can you what can you do to break from the format that you're creating? What can you do to break from the format that you're creating? Mm hmm. You mean like the fo the format of the dance that they're creating? Everything in the culture is starting yeah. to become, this is how it's done. Yeah. Like that can be broken just from a, a, just a change of mindset, whether it's your approach to creating your, your vibe, your style, um, you know, your personal style. Yeah. Um, how things should be done doesn't have to be. Like these events don't have to be the same the w way they were uh, pre-COVID. Like you can totally change it. Um, you can create a, a new type of party vibe that maybe is somewhat relatable, but very different. But now it's opening things up to where some of the same stuff that we used to enjoy, now they can start to enjoy, even though it might be a different way. Um, right. Just overall, just the overall of, how can you how can you uh change the format of what's going on right yeah how can you break break the break the flow or break yeah break your habits pretty much mm -hmm. yeah that's what i say yeah yeah <laughs> i mean yeah. thanks for asking me no one no one throws it back so that was kind of cool yeah i mean why wouldn't i i would want to know what you would ask them the new or, generation yeah i mean i, mean, I guess I, mm -hmm. I guess like for me, like a conversation like this back in the day, if I heard some old school rats talking, I'd be like, I want to hear that. Yeah. You know, but 
I just wonder, like, hey, do you guys care? Even do you guys care about the history of dance? Like, would you guys know where all these, like, you know what's awesome? You know what I randomly fell upon the other day was, um, uh -huh. you know, remember Dietrich? Like, Quest yeah. Crew and all them. So yeah. Dietrich's like, I kind of already fell out of the dance scene by the time Quest Crew, actually post Quest Crew, but like, Dietrich is still choreographing, and I saw his chore his choreography, and it's it's amazing. It's mm. it's amazing. It's it's all like the the ABDC show really pushed like the group choreography concept really well, and it's it's pretty awesome. And I guess I'm just I'm wondering is that what that is now? Is that what all the I haven't I didn't go further into watching past Dietrich, but I know that yeah. he was a strong YouTube presence, so he's a huge following from that. Um, but mm -hmm. also a huge following from him being a dancer. And it's just awesome to see that he's like, he's now, he's still dancing, but he's also like, you know, choreographing and like teaching, teaching, building beasts and teaching these kids that like quest crew went way pretty much making dynamic yeah. group choreography, which is pretty awesome. I just wonder if that's like, is that what everyone's doing now? Like hype ABDC choreography because of like, mm -hmm. you know, all the I amazing think... stuff they saw in ABDC with, Beat Freaks even yeah. and big shout out to Beat Freaks, yeah, yeah. Big shout out to Beat Freaks. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, they kind of went some different ways. Um, I, I think honestly, anything from the new generation where they're they're just drilling and working hard. If it's on, if it's choreo based like that, and then even if it's just working on your craft and beating on your craft from a street dance perspective, from the artistic side um of your indi individual self um yeah i that's that's i respect that no matter what you know yeah um and i feel like maybe that work ethic isn't in everybody and it's hard to put that in a group setting so anytime you can do that it's amazing again, yeah. it's amazing as long as you're you're, you're not out of pocket because there's been a whole drama this year which we won't get into and and who it's about we don't need to talk about that um <laughs> There's a way to do everything yeah. without crossing the line. Um, but yeah, anyone who has that kind of grind and passion, uh, it's not work at that point. Yeah, you can classify it, but it's really not for those individuals. It's like you're grinding because you love it and you're about it. The passion is there. And, and anytime you can see that, it's great. But I, I see less and less of that um, in a general sense, no matter what dance genre. Um, so I'd just like to see more of that. Yeah, yeah, I would too. I would too. Yeah, yeah, Definitely, yeah. You know what? I I also want. I have a question too. Is like I would mm -hmm. one of my my martial arts stunt woman friends who is also my martial arts students because I mm -hmm. teach online weapons classes three times a week. She hey. is a B girl too and a pole dancer, and she's like a whole generation younger than I am. But she is in New York, and she told me that there's not any more B-girls over there. And I remember being awesome. in LA and my, like towards the end of my, what's up, Mr. Guillotine? <laughs> At towards the end of my <laughs> career, there was amazing B-girls in New York that I, that when I was exiting the, the scene, she told me yeah. they're not, they're not there anymore. So it's like, yeah. I, that's why I feel like after we had that conversation, I, I was like, I'm pretty sure that I am the last generation of like so many B-girls. Cause during my time, there was enough B-girls in the world that they would have Two on twos all the time, yeah. everywhere, one on ones, local, whatever. Um, and any event you went to, you would see. I mean, there's always less than the fewer than the b boys, but there was enough. But she's saying there's not anyone in New York anymore. And I, I guess my question <laughs> for the girls is like, why are there? Why do you guys not want to do do it like we did in our generation? I know I my personal journey as a b girl is like. I've retired. I, I went on to making a career out of being a stunt woman martial artist. But every, the essence of me as a B-girl is taken with me to my film fighting style and to me as a roller dancer and as a filmmaker. Absolutely. My personality, my style, the way that I move is fully, I, I move as a film fighter differently because of my being a B-girl. Not because I'm a martial artist and a gymnast, because those things are very common things that go hand in hand as a film fighter. But because I'm a B girl, it's that much more different. So my question is, and I know Miss Lee has now she's in stunts too, but I, I my question is like, why do girls not want to be B girls anymore? That's that's mm. I'm just wondering like what 
what are they again is it because all like and i get it too because i even became an all styles dancer later um even though i became an all styles dancer i still i still was breaking and competing so i guess my question yeah. is yeah why is is b growing so rare and so so difficult it's difficult i know it's it's yeah. really hard it's a certain type of person but what nowadays you would think there's like multi i would have think by the time i retired there's gonna be like you know mm -hmm. i'm biting your swimming pool stunts but black people can't swim <laughs> wait who said that's that? not true david goggins can swim that's so funny just saying that's so funny Break them uh, stereotypes. hilarious okay how do i put this away now oh wow there's so many comments cool uh yeah, yeah. and that's my Let's last see. question that's a good one yeah. that's a good one and um yeah maybe there is no specific answer but of course uh inspiration and influence is always going to be a factor right so yeah sometimes if it's just not out there they're not gonna they're not gonna see it if it's not the trend maybe they're not gonna do it so there's always that kind of that kind of uh issue that maybe has to be tackled at some point but yes. yeah there's so many resources and i think you're an amazing one and uh and, I, and thank you for dropping the names of some of those other b girls as well so people can look them up oh my god and, so uh, many yeah. so many okay b girl nadia from russia I think mm. she might be still killing it. She was, when I was leaving, I found her through Nasty Ray because she was one of Nasty Ray's favorite B-girls. And she, she's one of my favorite dancers too because she was an all styles dancer, but an amazing B-girl. She was my, one of my favorite B-girls, movie one. Um, I think there was one called B-girl Maka too when I was leaving. I, mm. I never met her in person. I saw tons of footage. Who's Jack? Do I know Jack? I know a couple of Jacks. <laughs> He's, is it the, he's Jack, Jack. the snowboarder Jack guy? I don't know. <laughs> What's up, Amy? Um, yeah, so many. And then Jules, Lady Jules. Like, dang, I yeah. could list so many amazing B-girls for you guys to all look up if you even care. Because I feel like B-girling is such a rare thing. It really does take a certain type of individual to want to be a B-girl. Yeah. Like, be it. Not just do some moves and breakdance, but to actually, like, live it and call yourself b-girl whatever it is it's like a big deal mm -hmm. miss lee uh, also another an amazing b-girl i don't know b-girl red you oh most of me sorry sorry okay yeah jack miles dad miles dad yes sorry <laughs> <laughs> gotcha i do know you jack um <laughs> but yeah i can make a list of b-girls from back you should do it trinity in new york um, mm -hmm. Integrity and Trinity, I think they're still repping. And then Abby Girl was one of the big, like to me, one of my favorite B-girls from New York back in the day. And I heard she, she still sometimes occasionally just enters a battle for for fun and like makes it yeah. pretty far. So, yeah. That was yeah. Like my I, honestly, like even if it's just the Instagram post or if you want to put it somewhere else, it is, when you have some free time, I would honestly just bullet point yeah high love like legendary however you want to phrase it uh b girls yeah just and make the whole list make a resource for people to look at you know what's crazy i think it's too, worth it i have a lot of footage of these b girls too because i i was one of the people who actually brought cameras to events and i have them on <laughs> mini dv tape and i need to someday yeah. just edit it i just need to put it i have footage you know what i have this yeah. underground battle of I feel like Rockefeller and maybe Abby Girl. I, I have a battle, like it was 2001, maybe 2002. And it was like during, um, at the end of, of B-Boy Summit and like Rockefeller and Abby Girl just decided to just go rounds like till tired, till death. And that was like an outside, outdoor cipher outside of the event, the event's over. And so yeah. um, I have to find that footage. <laughs> I have some pretty good footage too. You gotta you find some footage, footage. You just put it on YouTube. Yeah. Put it on YouTube. I got some I got some ill footage when uh Crazy Kill and Pop and Jay came to LA in 09. I think 09 was an amazing year. 09 was, was crazy, an amazing year. Crazy. That was that was an amazing yeah. year. 2010 so. was like my heyday, like the peak peak of my good. career. Yeah. When I like yeah. went traveled well, it was my last couple travels to enter battles and stuff. Yeah. Um, I got to do a submission now. <laughs> I got to do a job submission right now. So, okay. 
It's so awesome to talk to you. Thank you, everybody, whoever Thank was you. listening. And, and, and we will be posting this on IGTV or on YouTube. Or both. Or both. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to figure it out. Thank you so my, so much, Shopping. No, thank you. That was amazing. That yeah, was so thank fun to so catch much. up with you. Good yes, job definitely. keeping the, the, the history alive. I, I, hey, it gave, me, it gave me a lot. It's only right to continue that. And we're talking about tradition. Like, we have to be that tradition and, and carry it on ourselves. So, yeah, yeah that's what I'm doing. I'm going to do my best to continue that. And hopefully one day someone else does that as well. Yeah, and thank you for making me do IG Live because I've never done it before. And it's good yeah. to see like people <laughs> make comments and be like, hi. It's thank nice, you, especially because people from both sides, like people that follow each other, your friends, my friends, uh, they have the opportunity if they to so click choose. and like look. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Very much so. Thanks, yo. I hope you have an amazing uh, night and I hope the, the job submission goes well. And yes. uh, yeah, thank have you. an amazing week. Thank you. Take care. For sure. Bye. See you soon. Peace, y'all. Peace. Peace, everybody. Yeah. Yes, William Spencer.